Did you ever use them? No. Ah, okay. It's good this stuff. This is Harbor Town. You, you built, I saw your Lego thing. You just yeah, he just pictures of that was cool. Yeah, I, I've decided that it's a temple of work. A miniature building uh -huh. I've got to take in tabletop I probably have to take. Well, no, I didn't need the flexible uh, and playable Raven Harbor Town will take your game. Yeah. I've got it decorated with with uh, bats, but that's because Lego offered me bats. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, good. They hear us, so. <laughs> I don't know if Warren Forge is going to do a uh, Kickstarter this year. Usually they do one. So I, um, I produced for a seven and a half, a half hour game that Stefan Picorni ran uh, to finish up Gary Con VTT. Mm -hmm. That was <laughs> that was interesting MDMing uh, for of Dwarven Forge. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love their Steven likes to put on a show. Yeah, he does. <laughs> but you're, um, when you when you sent me that uh, that Dwarven Forge, and I got it out, and I was like, oh my gosh, this stuff lights up. I mean, they've come a long way. You know, oh yeah, yeah, they have. And I'm not, I don't buy the lighting stuff in general because it's, you know, it's not my thing. Um, you know, they sell you the streets and they sell you the, uh, the uh, undercity, but I don't buy all that junk because I just, well, I just don't. We're going to go live with you at 7.50, so we got uh, our time. So we got four minutes. Oh! <laughs> Woohoo! Yeah. Run to the bathroom. Yes! <laughs> That's something. Everyone loves dice. We all have a few thousand. Well, I used to have in the ballpark of a thousand guys. But over the course of the last few years, I've sent off hundreds and hundreds of guys. Well, I, I mean, that's really cool. And all that crap. That you're doing all that. You're giving away a lot of that stuff. That's well, crazy. you know, we, we uh, sold our home in, um, in um, Long Beach. And we're in the middle of doing that. You have all boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff that you can pack up. And if you're, you know, while you're packing, you might as well put a little more incentives. Mr. Teeks. Yeah, are these few dice, were those few dice, few workshop? Uh, the dice? No, the dice. They're called Titan Dice, <laughs> and I call them my fumbling dice and my, my roll one for initiative dice. They're like yeah. big, and uh, so I, uh, I, yeah, you can see the difference. I'll, this one runs twice. So um, I have these, and I give them away on Thursday nights during my game, and the strategy sponsors the channel. Yeah, they're, tw they're huge, but they're really cool, and uh, they have a pink set now. Uh, they have uh, a couple other colors as well, so um, yeah, we give them away. What's up, Adam? Have you seen the Dice from Q Workshop? No, I have not. Uh, uh, they, uh... The new workshop is in Poland. Right? Yeah, I have a, an oh. Elven set from them. They're beautiful. Yep. There's some very, very, very nice ones. Yeah. All of which are sitting in the casino, so I can show them to you. Cool. It's amazing. My media collection of probably about 200 or so dice, but I have a oh, yeah, set yeah. of Q dice, so yep. Yeah. So I'm well I'm stocked that one. Yeah. It's when they came out, early 2000s, something like that. They started production 2004 or 5 or something. Be, that could be right, yeah. Yeah. I saw them pop up and, and, and I bought it. They said they had Elven, Elven dice. I think they should have them here somewhere. I even have a special dice cup for them. I mean, dice are like a premium thing now, you know? It's like crazy. Yeah. Well, I'm a... Like, yeah. For every day dice, I like small spoon. Yeah. Yeah, I have them in a, a special dice cup. Let's see if I, I can. Sure they they, they like, like this. Hopefully, I can. Yeah, they, they, they have special Elven inscriptions. That's cool. Oh, here comes Mike. You're late. Here he goes. Admit. Here's a Mike. Hawk Mike Bridges, welcome. I'm check for Alan, yeah, but that's okay. You alright, Greg? You alright, Mike? Oh, he has his hand over his mouth. 
Just at probably... dinners. Yeah. Just at dinners or something. Yeah. Well, I, I left a message for Alan. Maybe he's just running behind or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to throw out some, uh, you know, I put that nice bone hill with a skelter in the background picture. You know, I wanted to do that, throw that up there. Uh, you know, so all two is, like I said, um, it's all my wall of fame. Which is, uh, I, I never drove. Theoretically, that's, uh, that's the way. Let's go on live. How about we do that? Let's go on live now. How about that, guys? Good evening. Hopefully everyone is uh, excited as excited as I am and as Anna and Greyhawk Mike is. Yep. Welcome. Mm -hmm. I'm Jay K. Lord Gazamba, and we have a unbelievable uh, night tonight. Legends Lore. Now, Larry's been on Gavin twice, which I really mm -hmm. appreciated. This is a, this 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 show Wednesday night started on another channel with uh, Anna and Mike, and they were it's more Greyhawk meat based. There's more. Um, oh. But uh, but that's okay, man, because we're gonna do a Q and A with you tonight. So Leonard, welcome. Great to have you on. Thank you. Uh, um, Anna said, and we all said we love the hat. So <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, we didn't know you were a bard, Leonard. That that's so cool. You that well, too. you know. <laughs> uh, well, I go back to the original bard. I had one character who went through all the work of becoming a bard. Oh wow! That took Both a the... long time. That took yeah. A three or four years of real time yeah you know we we do a session yeah fighter five hours once a week yeah seventh five, level uh, fighter eighth level thief then bard you know it's and then, and then they start the dream yeah mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a herculean undertaking and uh, we still do it that way just make bard yeah. super special in the campaign yeah you know so it's um, the first prestige classes before there were. Prestige yeah, that, that's classes a good point, and that's it's a real very good point. much like the third edition Pathfinder <laughs> prestige class. Yeah. So we got people just still hopping on because, of course, we're on a little early, uh, normally yep. our eight o'clock time. Yep. But I forewarned everyone in posts that we'd yep. be going on a little early. So. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll save Leonard. We'll save the surprise for another ten minutes as our regular people go. Oh, it's eight o'clock and they come on. So uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, Leonard and I were just talking about um, in, on the background about some things. You want to uh, relay, like, you know, um, if you don't, it's okay. Like, what's going on right now in your in your uh, life? You know, I know you're happily. Oh, you don't want to know. Uh, yeah, I, I've got uh, acute myeloid leukemia, okay. so I'm going to chemo for that. Now, it's not curable, but it's in remission, which is, you know, your second best thing, sort of. Right. Yeah. We hope. That's and wonderful. Uh, Alan yeah. Groey has just joined us. Good evening, Alan. Hello. Hello, Leonard. Hi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? We have certainly chatted innumerable times. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. Wonderful to see you again, Alan. Hey Mike, I'm, Anna, hey Jake. We're having we're gonna have a blast tonight. I think it's gonna be a real a real great show. Now I know that Alan was working uh, and Gitano had jumped the gun at uh, Lefavi and done a whole bunch of stuff that uh, the, they're trying to create. Uh, go ahead, Alan. Why don't you explain what you're trying to do for Leonard? Uh, well, I, I had started working on a just a bibliography of your writings and stuff. Uh, Oh, I don't know, maybe in the fall or so and started putting pieces and parts of it together, sitting on my blog, just in draft state. And uh, I hadn't gotten around to getting it into a, any kind of final form to be able to share with you to say, hey, what else is missing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Gaetano has been putting together a similar thing and he's been posting pictures or something up on uh, Facebook, uh, kind of showing snippets of it, which is great. So. Yeah. yeah, and he, what he did was he, uh, I have it here. <laughs> He did a book. I have the uh, the Dragon Magazine. Most of them are all of the uh, Layman's Tiny Huts, right. and then all of your Dragon's Foot uh, um, contributions are here as well. So that's and what, footprints, yeah. Yes, and footprints, yeah. So yeah. Um, it's uh, it's it's a it's getting uh, it's getting put together, which is a great thing. Well, I did stuff for Earth Journal. Yep. yep. And I went out of business uh, recently that I did a few things for. The, I don't know. Yeah, you had a few in Gygax magazine. Yes, that. Yeah. Uh, but there's somebody else that went out of business too. Hmm. Um, so you were not in Cobalt Quarterly? No, you didn't never did anything for Cobalt. No, it was something that, that, that came out when they got around to doing it. 
Uh huh. Okay. Yep. Um, which is, you know, you know, sort of the way that that kind of thing works. Well, let me see if I can find it. A good thing, uh, I just want to let everyone know that we're probably at 80% that we're going to have a very special surprise guest pop on in the second hour. Okay. Oh my God. To say, I, I know Leonard, you're going to have to, if you're going, if you want to, <laughs> you may have to hang in there for him <laughs> because yeah, he, so. yeah. that's what he told me he could make it. So I'm like, uh, hey, hey uh, come on uh, as quickly as you can. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, his, uh, his initials um, uh, are the same as living Greyhawk. So there you go. So hopefully we will see that individual pop on uh, in the second hour. To say, I don't oh, mean which would be really cool. So, um, yep. guys, uh, thank you all for coming on. The crowd is, is really starting to amass. Um, this is a Q and a night. So why don't we just go around and, and, uh, uh, since, uh, Alan's, uh, uh the newest to the, the group here, as far as a uh, non-regular, why don't we, Alan, ask a question of Leonard. Why not? And we'll, and then we'll just ask it. Then we're going to open up to the audience. How's that sound? Okay. Um, is uh are we before the start of the show or no we're, no, we're live we're, oh we're, we're already live okay we all, right. Early. <laughs> all right no worries yeah um so one of the things i was very interested in uh leonard uh and we've corresponded a little bit about some of this stuff over the years was uh the various character classes you've created for D. &D. Mm -hmm. um you had done a lot of work around clerics um in addition to defining all the Sewell gods and stuff and you had created the pyrologist back in the wizard newsletter a uh, long time right. ago. Right, that's a long, long um, time ago. Yeah, so I didn't know if uh, you could talk a little bit about some of the ones that you've done and sort of how you go about creating character classes, um, maybe from well, a design point of view. I, I did the, the archer class, and then I revised that, and I gave it to somebody to publish, and I don't know if they published it or not but I can make it available. Um, because there was something wrong with the uh, Archer Ranger where the numbers and experience points and all that crap didn't come out correctly as, or as correctly as I wanted it to. No, that's so on Greyhawk Online, it. Leonard. It's on Greyhawk Online. I gave it to uh, I gave it to Christoph and he put it on there uh, last year. That, okay. that addendum, yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I wanted to add, what, what always bothered me about D, D in general is you take a long bow and at 240 feet you do no additions no subtractions but at 241 feet you do a minus two and then at um, 421 feet you do a minus five and I said what happened to minus one minus three and minus four because they obviously exist in the spectrum somewhere so you just have to create the ranges for those things to happen. And there's innumerable things in D&D &D that are like them, where they have a big layout, including three of this or two of that or five of the other thing, when in reality, they should break down in the individual thing. And it's one of my crusades in the background to try to fill those gaps in. Uh, or fill them in as I see them. Um, sort of so like the 5% principle charts, you know. Right, you right, about something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, I did the, the, the universal chart that shows all of the classes plus the monsters simultaneously all on the same piece of paper. Uh, and I published that, I published that more than once, I think. Uh, because I found as a DM, it's just a hell of a lot easier to have it all on one sheet of paper, as opposed to looking here, and then you look there, and then you look here, and you go, oh, uh, it's just too much work. Um, you know, you've got those things in like speed factor and all of that. I looked at that and I laughed and I ignored it. Um, because it's just stuff that weighs you down. The melee is long enough. If I run individual melee. I do it round by round for everybody in the whole goddamn melee. Now, that takes a long time, but it's accurate. It's incredibly accurate. And I do false rules. Like, uh, my biggest false rule is 
that if you start casting a spell, it's at the beginning of segment one, and then you, as many segments as it takes is when it ends. So now all missile fire and blows are in the middle of rounds. So you know when you hit that you're going to cause the spell to stop or not cause the spell to stop. If you don't hit, the spell will go on. Now it's artificial as hell, but it makes the melee flow easier because you don't have that, that question of, well, now did I screw up his spell, didn't I? He's casting whole person uh, and he's casting it on three of the people in my party and I want a magic missile in to stop him from doing it. And in that system, I can tell when all of that happens. Um, but, well, and then, you know, the other thing I created was um, magic weapons that are plus one to hit or plus one to damage, in addition to being plus one uh, to hit and damage, which allows you to sneak in those weapons, swords and hammers and whatever, uh, at lesser value, but you still have a magic weapon. Because regardless if it's, if it's plus one to hit only or plus one to damage only, it's still a magic weapon. So it'll still hit a gargoyle if you hit him. I, I, I love the, uh, that, that variation on weaponry. We use it. We use masterwork as plus one to hit, and then we have keen and all sorts of different other things. So you were—I mean, I think you were right on track back then to give a little more variety, and then not to jump right into that from regular weapon right into a, you know, a magical sword. So, well, I, I, well, I, I, I did L, when I did the companions for L four and L five. I reiterated it there. The companion is a bunch of house rules that I used. Now you can use them or not use them. You know. It's, it's like everything else. It's like Gygax said, you know, it's all a guy, it's it guidelines. Um, you can do what you want. It's your campaign. The only time Gygax was absolutely on track is when he was running something for a convention. Then he would follow the rules as closely as he could possibly follow. But if he was doing his own thing, uh, he would improvise all over the place. Yeah, and... Uh... The game is meant, and I, I think uh, we're, we're all DMs here, the game is meant to be played as you see fit, and that's what's so wonderful about it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So um, let me ask a question off of that, because uh, Alan and I have very similar necromancers <laughs> as, as a special class, but you have a death master instead. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just saw the need for a really, really bad guy. Was that the, the idea behind it? Well, no, he, he, he was complex to build. Um, yep. And he's got things that can go wrong in the final stages of becoming a death master. True, true. It can, it can go to hell on you. I, I think it's a potion that you have to drink. And uh, if, if the results are wrong, well, you're just dead. Yeah. Life the uh, the lich potion, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that became a standard in third edition and several others when I saw rules. Well, you can have the death master as an opponent, uh, and he certainly will bring a lot to bear on you. Uh, undead galore. Oh yeah, I mean it's just it's crazy. Uh... They are great and uh, nemesis in, in certain uh, campaigns. Uh, I use them occasionally. Well, at low level, I think the, uh, the most devastating undead is a ghoul. Oh, yeah. A ghoul can really rock up a party. If he paralyzes everybody, mm -hmm. then, you know, you're screwed. It's over. It's over. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I always played him that only the hands paralyzed. I didn't, the bite didn't. Okay. That's just the way I played it. And if both claws hit, there was still one saving throw because they both hit at the, in the same, not necessarily same melee round, segment, I should say. But I didn't do two saving throws. I only did one to see if he got paralyzed or didn't get paralyzed. You're much more kind than I am. I yeah, am. I, I hit him with three. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. one of the things that Gygax said, one of his quotes was, 
always give the monster an even break. And whatever I apply to a monster, I apply to the party. So the party has no perks that the opponents have, don't have. And I'm one of the people that took the, uh, I think it's somewhere advice in one of, the, one of the books that your first hit die is the average high. So if you do a 10-sided die, the average high is six. So you're guaranteed six points from the first roll. But I do that for all your opponents too. They get the same thing. So you have some advantage there. Because what's the point of rolling a fighter with an 18, 22 strength and one hit point? <laughs> you know, yeah. my God, you know, a, 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 a mosquito bites him when he's falling. <laughs> yeah, makes, I mean, I do maximum hit points at first level. Does everyone else do that? Yeah, I think that's become standard in all the latest editions, and I always do that. I even just the first. Yeah, I I even use negative hit points that based on constitution. So if you take more, oh yeah, those, I have a not, chart with that. Yeah, so I have a chart different. for everything. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. And uh, what I did was I put the, those charts in a special section of the room, and just we'll we'll we'll, we'll tidbit that there. There's Lake Keel and Anna's map, and then there's all the Restonfords coming up. So. We will show those as the as the discussion goes on. I got a lot of cool stuff and a large screen so that everyone can see what we're talking about. Because I know uh, there's three different, there's rest of her maps based on the year. 575, 76, and 77. Right. Yeah, so there's, we got and three. Then you, and then you retrograde it to go backwards because uh, when I did L3 in detail, I statted up all of those people that I skipped in L1 and in L2 is, is when the party goes somewhere else, I don't remember. And then L3 is the deep roar of the Dell. Well, L3 is precipitated by the fact that the town gets attacked in 576. Uh, and, you know, they burn a bunch of stuff down and kill a bunch of people. But they don't make a real, real death. Uh, they did not come with enough strength. But then you have to follow them to the delve and um, go in after them. Well, when I was playing the delve, I, I did the upper works and we broke for, for a, a session. And I said, you know, they're in this middle room and the forces are coming from the left and coming from the right. I said, I think this needs a secret door. And if it has a secret door, it should lead down. So I do a spiral down in L3. So you're going through a bunch of stuff that wasn't there in the original design, but added because the players got into a trap spot and I had a week to do the design so that when they came back the next week, I was ready for them, more or less. <laughs> I believe in, in awarding persistence. You know, if you've got people who come in and search everything. Just search everything, no matter what it is. And every now and then I'll throw something in just to reward them for, the, for their persistence. Uh, I like to reward that kind of thing. It may not have been there originally, but it sure has helped them show up. And I usually don't do that with magic. I might do it with a few coins. I might have you finding a couple of dead bodies. Uh, and of course they might have stuff on them. But uh, I think per persistence re deserves a reward when I can do it. Uh, I don't go nuts, well, a little, but <laughs> uh, it, it, a little's okay, right? A little's okay. Yeah. Yeah. A little's okay, absolutely. Okay, Mike, what do you got? You got to have something there. I know you. Uh, sorry, I've been quiet, guys. I, uh, one thing real quick. Am I the only one who Twitch is not working for them yeah, right now? Here's the deal. Uh, and this is to everyone on. If you're using the old Edge browser, it's not working. You need to upgrade to the new Edge browser. Okay? Uh, and that could be your... Yes. I just found that out right before Leonard came on. So go to Google or just <laughs> up, or yeah, or upgrade okay. your Edge. You can, it takes about 10 seconds to upgrade the browser. 
Well, I didn't want to like yeah, Chrome Chromeworks. Chromeworks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Fire. Uh, what's the other one? Firefox works. Yeah, I use Vivaldi. The old works, Edge too. browser yeah. does not work. Okay, guys. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and who knows what they did to update it today? And but it's as of today, and you get a circle spinning in the middle, right, Mike? Yeah. That's what mm-hmm. it is. It's Edge. You got to upgrade it to the newest Edge browser. So, Gadzooks. Yeah, right. Gadzooks is correct, man. I mean, yeah. th- no warning. <laughs> um, I figured it out on my own. Uh, yeah. You know, just crazy stuff. Yeah. Like I said, I didn't want to eat up too much time fussing over that. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, no, I'm just curious. Uh, <laughs> and there's there's the doggy. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, now you oh, muted. Muted. You muted. There you go. Sorry. Lynn, I was just curious about yeah. your meaning. His mouth is moving, but... Yeah, you're real low. You're real low. Yeah, Mike's like, what the hell's going on? All right, try again, Mike. He's muted again. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I might pull myself out of this interview real quick here. <laughs> um, naming conventions, uh, naming NPCs and stuff like that. Uh, you need curious. the volume up just a smidge. Hmm. Start yelling. Just, just. Okay. Well, don't yell. Just turn your volume. Up. Now this is. That's good. That. It's a little better. A little I don't better. know why I'm cutting in and out. Yeah, you are a little better. bit. There you go. Now yep. you went back up. Okay. Yep. Oh, <laughs> jeez. Yeah. That's good. Um, okay. NPCs. I was just curious if you had any system for naming your NPCs. Good question. Yeah, I, I dream up the name. There it is. <laughs> now, when two people marry and have children, I have a system for that. Uh, I will take the first three letters of one person name and add it to the last three letters of the other person name depending on whether it's the daughter or the son. But that's just a naming prerogative that I use. I don't use it all the time, but I often use it. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Make life easy. Yeah. It's a good uh, good thing to know. Good question, Mike. Definitely. Yeah. Piggy, piggybacking on Mike's question, did you do any kind of uh, naming conventions for like the Sewell, uh, different from, say, uh, Oridians or uh, the Flan or stuff yeah, like that? Gary's world is the Oridians. Uh, I didn't deal with that a whole lot. Uh, when I went to the continent, I did some work on Iron Gate and whatever the two provinces are on either side of it. And I did um, Hold of the Sea Princes and I did Radic. And I've returned to Radic to do Laocoon. Um But otherwise, in the Great Kingdom and uh, the North Province and that sort of stuff, I didn't interface with all of that. I figured that was Gygax's world, and that's where Gygax did all of his stuff. Um, well, he had a regular game in Lake Geneva. I don't know if it was once a week or more than once a week. Uh, I know when we would get to a point where something really major is happening, we would have sessions on Saturday. We would come over on Sunday afternoon. One night we made the mistake of playing overnight until the sun came up. That's a mistake. <laughs> Never do that. Because God start coming down. It, it just, it, it, it turns to shit. I've, I've, I've done that too. Yep. Not to offend anyone. But uh, yeah, the overnight sessions, no. One in the morning, yeah, I did that a few times. When I was playing with the Meister family, I, I did them on Saturday. And we would play until 10 or 11, then we'd watch Dr. Who. Nice. And um, then we'd go back to the game again. And I'd leave there at 2 in the morning and get on public transportation. That's another world, too. I, luckily, I never got stabbed or robbed. But uh, <laughs> it's kind of a real life adventure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a real life adventure. 
it's the advantage of being six foot two. It, it does it does have a certain advantage to it, especially when I was uh, when I had just taken boxing and wrestling and everything. Um, now, well, now, but um, I went through that period of time where my weight went up to something nasty, and uh, I went up to 340 pounds. You just don't want to do that to yourself. You might as well. It, it's it's a eventual death sentence if you make that mistake. Now, but I did it. I'm not proud of it, but I did. And I went to uh, Overeaters Anonymous, and it turned out to be the right thing to do. And that's what anonymous groups are good for. Um, you run into people like yourself, so you can't pull your bullshit on them because they've all done it. So we're getting a lot of a lot of questions from the audience, oh. and so a lot, and this is great, and. So I'm going to show something, and guys, do not bombard me so that it's like looking like Critical Role sc scrolling up, okay? <laughs> uh, I, that I don't need. I got some questions we're going to get through. I'm going to scan through this real quick here in the end. And Leonard, out of the blue, it's just we're just sitting here talking, and Leonard's like, let's give something away. So I'm getting to it. There we go. All right, Leonard, what is that? That's from a Renaissance Festival. It's genuine letter made by some craftsman. It has that little dagger that goes with it. Um, and you wear it as a belt pouch. There's a, a, a hook on the back when you, you can uh, put it on your, on your belt. And uh, I put a few dice in it and some lucky soul is going to get it sent to me. Yes. And it's not a drawing, Josh. This is what we're going to do. We're going to, the best question of the day is going to get it based on Alan, myself, Mike, and Anna's determination. We are obviously, the four of us are not eligible. Okay? So, yeah, do not start hitting the drawing button thing. We're not doing it randomly. We're going to do it <laughs> on the best question. And do not start bombarding me, please. But we got some questions here. So, um, Gary uh, mentioned uh, um, one with Lendor without the R E and Lendor Isle. Is it, was it just... Lendor oversaw the island. What, the similarity in names is that what happened with? Well, I named a bunch of stuff in various places. Uh, okay. After the gods, there okay. were uh, there's forests that are named after the gods. There are hill, uh, hills and mountain ranges that are named after gods. Um, I probably took it too much to the extreme, but it's yeah, what okay. the hell. Uh, I, I I saw Lindor as the end of the one of the ends of the Sioux migration, and um, I had everybody worship Sioux gods that was human, no Iridians at all, nobody else. Um, now and then I would acknowledge the fact that there were other languages, so that people would speak. Uh, let's see, was it Kielandish? And there's one or two others that have their... Volandi, uh, there's a couple other yeah. dialect ones. So too. those would show. And of course, uh, you, you would have people who would speak uh, Dwarven and who know how to do sigils and, and what have you. Uh, so some people would go through the trouble of learning enough Dwarvish that they could, in fact, speak to somebody else. And that was advantageous during a melee because now you could yell an order in Dwarvish and with luck the orcs didn't understand. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff written about humanoids that says, well, and they also speak Dwarvish and they also speak Gnomish. Well, that's bullshit. Um, a few might. A few might learn Dwarvish for the sake of understanding what the opponent is saying. In other words, I'm aiming at you, stupid. Um, they'd like to know that. It's the time to hit the dirt, you know, and, and hope the arrow goes over. Next question. We're gonna do some addition wars. 
uh, <laughs> because someone asked what oh. your I know what your favorite edition is, but would you have, did you ever play third, fourth, fifth, or uh, uh, you know? I, I bought the books for third and I laughed and threw them away, and I bought the books for four and I laughed and threw them away. I did not buy five, nor do I wish. Okay. Um, I've heard too many times that five is too quote simplistic unquote, and I can't say that I can back that up based on actual value. And 3.5, I've heard some good things about 3.5, but the point is I'm, I'm centered in, in edition one with some edition two in my household. That's where I'm at. So um, L1, 2, 3, L4, L5, they're all edition one with my house room. And um, I take all of the spells that exist and are named again in L2, I use the L1 text almost exclusively. Um, one of the things they screwed up with L2, one of the people they really screwed up was the druid. Yes. You want the L1 druid, you don't want you, you don't want the addition, you want the addition one druid, you don't want the addition two druid. I agree hundred percent. They made him a subclass of cleric and just went off in the wilderness. Yeah, you you're you're absolutely correct on that. Um you know, in my opinion, second edition has its has some great things in, in it as well. Yes. And you know it does. Yeah. yeah. The, the thing I liked the most about Edition 2 was the upgrade of Giants and, and Dragons. I used it. Now, you have to let your players know that you're about to upgrade them because they're used to fighting Edition 1 Dragons and Edition 1 Giants. And all of a sudden, shit happened. <laughs> because now, the Hill Giant has suddenly got 12 hit dice. And you know, what? <laughs> yeah. So you got to let them know you're about to do that kind of crap. Um, anytime you do a rule and you're going to repeat the rule, you know, let your players know. Well, that was the beauty of the three booklets up front. I would be sitting there making rulings, and then I would type the rulings up, and I would give the players a copy of the rulings, and I'd send the copy to Gaia. So a bunch of that stuff ended up in the player's handbook in the Dungeon Master's Guide because you had to improvise. The, the three original books touched on a lot of things, but there was no depth. Yeah. So you're really you were bare on your own. You literally were on your own. Definitely uh, definitely a good question. Uh, so uh, we have a Phantom Ass, uh, and then we'll we'll do one uh, we'll do a couple from the from the th um, the three of you. Uh, Phantom Masks, uh, uh, what did you think of Unearthed Arcana when it came out in nineteen eighty three? Cavalier and Barbarian and, and, and those kind of classes. Um. Uh, the Cavalier problem is his fucking horse. I mean his horse. Forget I said that. <laughs> he has to have somebody watch the horse while he goes into the dungeon. Now, I would have him come out of the dungeon and find the, uh, the goblins eating the rest of the horse. <laughs> I and the squire. That. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing that today. Yeah. It's a it's a stupid class. It's a stupid subclass. Okay. It, it's fine if you're doing a lot of jousting, but you aren't. Uh, you go down in, in a dungeon. You don't go down the dungeon with the damn horse. So you're stuck, and and now you got to take two or three henchmen or hirelings and have them watch the damn stupid thing. And, and hope it doesn't die. What was the other one that you mentioned? Uh, well, the barbarian, and also in Arthur Kana, And I know, I know what you're going to say on this. They allow dark elves as player characters. I know you're going to kibosh that real quick. No, I, 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 I believe in the original classes pretty much. Okay. Um, I, I don't want the part dragon and the part this and the part that and all this other goofy kind of stuff. You see, uh, we all know the biology ecology and evolution of, of the world, you'd have these minor races wiped out. It would just happen. Uh, somebody would come in and say, you know, who the hell are you? And they'd kill them off. So you'd have orcs, you'd have goblins, you'd have ogres, you'd, you, you know, you'd have the, the big ones. But 
these little obscure races that exist in the Dungeons and Dragons system are evolutionarily ridiculous because they'd be killed off. I like they'd smart. Killed off either by humans or the others, one or the other. And if you keep raiding human enclaves, somebody is going to get a bunch of knights together and a whole army and go and make Swiss cheese out of you. So you, you have to be very, very careful when you're the uh, leader of the orcs or leader of the goblins and not go nuts because when you do, it's uh, you're committing suicide. You may not know it yet, but you are committing suicide. So Mike mentioned the thief acrobat, which was also in Dragon and then in our Unearthed Arcana also. Uh, I well, I, I, I did a little bit with that. I thought that the, the, the tumbling and tightrope walking and stuff like that was interesting. But I didn't do a lot of it. I used it as a skill, as a sub-skill of a, of a thief occasion. Um, because... You know, when when you grew up, there could be a circus that comes to town. We have circuses back in the medieval time. I don't see why you wouldn't. And the, the kid sees somebody walking a tightrope or a slack rope and thinks, well, that's interesting. How do I do that? And the guy shows him and then takes him on the road with him. And he becomes part of the act. Uh, now, he comes back home two years later, but he has that skill. Uh, so I believe in, you know, you take your neighbors, you take your parents, you take your mentors, and you take that stuff and you add it to their skill list. Uh, I don't care what you want to call it, and I don't limit it to some number of things. Um, I like to leave it open. So, you, you know, you're a cobbler, you're, you're a, uh, a uh, boyer, you're a... Uh, Armorer. <laughs> Fletcher. Mm -hmm. You're a Fletcher. Yeah. You have things that are, are, are really quite useful uh, because, you know, now all you have to do is find the right kind of bush or what have you that has a nice straight shaft to it, and you can make your own arrows because... Yep. You put that right in the archer class, Leonard, yeah. which was great. And you also put in that they could craft a bow that was crewed with n nothing within, they could use at minus two to hit within like an hour, you know, real quick, if they had to in a pinch, which I thought was really cool because there wasn't improvised weapons rules at all back then, you know? Yeah. So that was that was ahead of its time for the archer. So uh, that was cool. Definitely. Art's one of our favorite classes. I, I just have to say that the archer is, but uh, you know, it's a great PC class. Oh yeah, because it gives yeah. you point blank and it, it splits splits the ranges out. Yeah. Um, uh, over the series of negative numbers that are at the di different range classes, <clears throat> and uh, it makes sense that you have something like a point blank range. It really does. Uh, you should have an increased chance of that. I don't remember exactly what I did. Did I do plus two? Uh, well, it scales up, but but um, it's like one better than it's short in all the tables. But the good thing was was that it was it was eleven, you know, eleven to fifty, which uh, initially you couldn't shoot a longbow uh, under that at fifty one, <laughs> and, and which I, it didn't make much sense to me oh. in the game mechanics, especially miniatures rules. So. Oh, you're welcome, Zippy. I mean, there's, you know, we're, we're we're cranking it out here, so I appreciate you joining up with us, man. Thank you. So, Anna, you've been quiet. Why don't you ask something, and then I'm going to go to Bloodwild's question next. I was going to say I want to to Bloodwild had a wonderful question, so I'm going to ask that and on, on his behalf here, Mini. It's wonderful, uh, Leonard. How did you get into gaming? What was your the the, the reason you got into um, RPG? Well, I started out with. Um... The uh, Avalon Hill General, remember that? And you looked in the back, and there were a series of clubs and people. Um, and and you know, it was the bloodthirsty kids and the uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll eat your grandmother. And, and, you know, was, <laughs> wow. And then I ran into the International Federation of War Gamers, and they seemed like they were sane. And that's how I met Geiger. Oh. Um, we, uh, he worked in downtown Chicago, as you may know, and he was a, um, 
something for an insurance agency. And yeah, that's I would what I've heard. And have lunch with him. Yeah. He taught me how to play soju. It's a Japanese chess. Mm -hmm. um, and we got to be friendly. We got to play Battle of the Bulls on because you can do that with, you know, play by mail. And <laughs> he said he was going to run this convention. And I said, well, I'll be happy to show up. Um, that was Gen Con 1, 1968, if <sighs> recollection serves. Oh my. I think Scott Duncan ran something of a convention. And I'm going to say Baltimore, but I could be wrong. Because Avalon, no, it's I'm centered in Baltimore. Um, I traveled out there once. Um, Ned Shaw, I don't remember his first name. Um, he would come to conventions in um, um, Chicago, and we would go there and run a game that was current and play it so that people walking by could see what their newest newest game was. So I got a connection with him early on. He was the one who told me that Gary lost the company. I was visiting him in, I think it was, there was a convention in Long Beach or near Long Beach, near the airport in uh, Los Angeles. And he was there and, and said hello. And he says, you know, Gary lost the company. And I went, no, I didn't know that. But that's another long story. All right, so a couple questions here. Zippy Toga just yelled Bahamut. Explain how you use Bahamut and Tiamat, if I pronounce that correctly, with my South Jersey accent, as deities kind of in this, your Sully's Pantheon. Uh, well, yeah, uh, sure. You, you um, Certainly, Bahamut and Tiamat are lesser gods. There's, you just have to make them that. And you can attach them to whatever pantheon you want to attach them to. I attached them as honorary members of the soul pantheon but clearly you can attach them to other um, pantheons of god why not because they they are universal um and that allows you to to rein in the uh, the gold dragons and the silver dragons in one case and then of course the whole spectrum of all the colored stuff the tm um there's a place in there that says that and Tiamat came to Earth and put in a new red dragon or a new green dragon. And, had, and I like that. So I thought, you know, their status as lesser God should be there. Um, when I produced the Soul Pantheon, Gary um, saddled me with the standard powers of deities, which annoyed the hell out of me. But, you know, yeah, it was his game, so, you know, I had to go, oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> I would have done a, a little different, not, not insanely different, but I would have done a few things. Yeah. Well, that was a good one because, uh, you know, that's a lot. Of, like, Mike didn't know that. I mean, whoa, you know, something yeah. something cool. All right. Um, let me get to before it scrolls too far. Corey C. Lund. Liam and spells are based on an alteration of physical space, mostly. Was that your idea? Yeah, I want to add on to that because Good earlier, mm -hmm. I finally got my chat working. Good. Earlier in the chat, someone asked about the origin of Lehman's tiny hut. Mm -hmm. So that kind of is a combined question. Well, yeah, uh, Lehman, Lehman was obsessed with being protected. So Lehman's tiny hut was a way to, to escape into it and to give him some, some comfort. Um, so I did a number of Liam and spells that were based on protecting Liam. And once you had the spell available and you were teaching other people, the spell would now, of course, go out into the general realm. Um, but Liam was obsessed with not being killed. Which seems like a good, you know, that's, that should be job one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, stay alive, that's that's rule one. Because if you're dead, you can't do rule two and three and four. Did you write Liaman's lamentable blabberment? No, that was Gaiga. Okay, that was Gary, though. <laughs> well, it was Gary. Okay. 
It's simple. I got paid by the word. <laughs> so when you get paid by the word, you can go nuts. You can do three and four pages of stuff. Okay. Because, but but my mind works like that. I, I, I'm detail-oriented to the point of being obsessive. Um, that's always been a characteristic. Um, and, but it has. But So I've written a number of things and charts and what have you based upon the fact that let's take this thing and split it up. Let's not... Well, take... Um, Magic user, the ability to learn stuff. If you look at the chart, 10, 11, and 12 are all the same percent. That makes no sense. 10 should be different from 11, should be different from 12. And there's a bunch of things like that should happen. And I've tried to do those things whenever I ran across them. And I've published them whenever I ran across them. So a bunch of that stuff is in, in Lehman's Tiny Hut. Now, of course, when Gygax lost the company, Liam's tiny hut went into the toilet because any ally of, of uh, Gygax was not a, was persona non grata. Mm. And not to bring up a bad topic, along with Lender Isle too. <laughs> then, well, unfortunately, you know, they, unfortunately, yeah, uh, somebody came in and pissed all over it. Yeah, but you know. Not with us, not with everyone here. So, especially Anna. So, uh, yeah, uh, you know, with, with the map making on it too. So, um, uh, Alan, you it looks like you had a question. Did you have uh, have one there? Uh, sure. Yeah. So your your comments about the Sewell Pantheon with Bahamut and Tiamat reminded me a little bit of when you wrote up Wee Joss, uh, and I'm starting up a new character. Wee <laughs> Okay, Ouija. Like O U O U I J A. Like the Ouija board. Right, that makes sense. Ouija board, yes. Okay. Ouija. Thank you. So, uh, so I'm creating a paladin of Ouija for this new Greyhawk campaign I'm playing in, um, and uh, one of the things they're we're working through is sort of what that's going to look like as sort of a non-standard paladin, but. Uh, Ouija has relationship with dragons in the way you wrote her up. Yes. Um, so she can summon dragons who are lawful to bring to her aid and stuff. So did you envision any um, relationship between her and Bahamut uh, and Tiamat uh, and or sort of have dragons have a, you know, deeper relationship with her cults? Well, she can't, she can't command Bahamut and Tiamat to do anything. Right. But she certainly can give the others a heart to <clears throat> The reason she's a major god is because she's the goddess of death and magic. So she has two huge spheres. Great combo. I tried to use spheres of influence in two, and then I finally decided, you know what, this is just too much work. It just is, because in edition one, you had full access to every spell as magic reading. And now, once you went into specializing them, you might a few of you might be cut out of or have big subtractions. And you say, well, wait a minute, what just happened to my guy? He used to be able to do this and do that and do the other thing. Why did you take that away? And I said, oh, I'm sorry. And I took it back. And I took the specialization away. Um, I did like weapon specialization. I didn't like double specialization. But I like single specialization. That made a world of sense to me. I agree, absolutely. All right, so we got we got our first module question ah. from Jason Zavoda. Ah. Okay, now I got I got I got these three all right here. All right, so we got okay. whoops, we got Bone Hill, we got the Assassins. All right, wait a minute, uh, Assassins not Bone Hill, and if you have the Silver Anniversary Edition, Deep Dwarven Delve. Oh. Okay. In the corrupted yeah. version. In the corrupted <laughs> version, Leonard, we understand that, yes. But it's still your... So the question is... Uh, L2 is... Uh, uh, the Assassin's Knot features, obviously, in the Assassin's Guild, right, in in, in Restonford. What, uh, do you see them as ubiquitous across the cities of the Flannis? Like, I, uh, the answer to that is I'd say yes, but, you know, what, what do you think? 
for the most yeah, part. Yeah, I, I would think so. I don't see why not. Um, yeah. You might be less likely to have it in like Falconville, um, but you could have it somewhere else. See, Manville is named after the fact that there are manicorns nearby. And Lizardton is named after lizard men because they're nearby. Um, so let's do this. Let's show everyone the Restonford maps real quick in large scale from 575 to 577. Why don't we do that? That way, and then uh, it'll pop back onto that way, you can uh, do some descriptions as to what happens here. I think that'll be a good idea. Let me uh, pop this up here. Uh, scene 11. All right. Uh, uh, um, we'll, we'll go back to that because we haven't even talked about the new one. All right. Here we go. So this is Restonford in 575, correct, Leonard? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, that's L1. That is L1. This is this is your map in L1, guys. Okay, that's the map you drawn by drawn by Ron Kalibik. Yes, and he does he's, a great. He has some software that does this, mm -hmm. and he's also going to do Laekio for me when he gets around to it. Excellent. Okay, next, this is Restonford and five seventy six. And this is when it gets attacked by the hordes that show up. They basically come down those two roads that come in from the north. Uh, they come down those roads. And you'll see a bunch of these things are um, got axes next to them because they've been yeah. destroyed or mostly destroyed. Especially in the northern part of town, in the northwestern Correct. part of town, Correct. yes. Correct. Okay. And they did succeed in crossing that bridge of the Reston River and screwing around with whether it's farmers and fishermen that are over there. They killed a bunch of them. Excellent. And then, lastly, we have 577. Yeah. Well, 577 is the reconstruction of Restonford, bringing everybody from L1, giving them all statistics. Mm -hmm. And um, so... All of the um, level one and level two people now have statistics and weapons and capabilities and guns and all of that schmerz. I added all of that and then show them the spreadsheet. Please. Okay, uh, that should be next. Ah. This is a little overkill, guys, but this is Leonard at his best. Oh! <laughs> okay. Restaford, year okay. one now, after that. <laughs> it's all color coding. So when you. When you get this thing, you have to print it you know, on a color printer. Because if you don't, all of this stuff that I've taken the time, the color code is just going to be shades of gray, which won't do you any good at all. Thank you, Geek. Yeah, so this shows alignment, armor, weapons, uh, a lot of a lot of information. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, then, and then you see the, the class summary sheets yep. where you have... One's under fighters and one under um, yeah. RP would be a ranger or a paladin. And at the very bottom, it sums them all up and it does a, um, a sum that shows that all of the people that are listed in count, which is column two, tallies with all of the, of the tallies from classes. That all tallies out. It is. And, uh, did you use a similar spreadsheet like this for your dungeon levels as well, Leonard? No. Okay. No, this is when I do a whole town. Um, this is my, this is not my default method, but L three was bringing into line everybody from uh, L one. Right. So yeah. all of those people who were named in the past are still there. Wow. So, and this is five pages long, guys. So I just see. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. So there you go. And uh, the color coding with the blue, they're clothiers, correct? Is that what that was? The, the blue was. Uh... No, it's something else. It's uh, they're not all clothiers. It's something else. Yeah, and then we got off yeah. to the very top. I think the light blue. Is okay, I'll go back blue. through, and uh, I gotta I gotta scroll through only in one direction. The fishermen, they're all the fishermen. So, <laughs> and then, uh, kids, and let me go back to the top here. There we go. We're back to the top. Light so. blue is. Oh, 
not from L3. Oh, arrive in the last 10 months. So that's 577. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So this is a great, if you want to run these, you have the entire progression of, of Restonford at your fingertips. Um, and uh, Leonard, you were, you were fine with people asking for these, correct? The the, yep. the, the three Restonford yep. maps and this. What I'd spreadsheet. like you to do is if they will give you your mm-hmm. their email, their snail, mm-hmm. uh, I will wait a couple of days and mass mail a bunch of them. Uh, I don't want to, you know, mail Joe and Fred and Harvey and Bill. I'd rather right. do Fred and Harvey and Bill all in one email. So do the following. Uh, some of you I have, if it, if I I know who you are, just just put it in Twitch in a direct message to me. I'll compile it. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, Phantom. If I get deluge, it's fine. Uh, and then Leonard will send this out to you directly uh, on his, on Liamin's email. So there you go. You get it from Liamin himself. So uh, feel free to just whisper me, and I'll get the names together for Leonard and and forward it to him. So uh, and and if you'd okay. like uh, Leonard, we could get them up on Greyhawk Online as well. If you'd yeah. like the folks to be able to download them from there. Yeah, we too. could get. Yep, absolutely. We could probably get them as a download. So we're at five forty-five, and I have to leave slightly after six. So. If there oh. are more questions, now is the okay. time. Poor Luke. Luke's going to come on like... Ten- oh, I just gave it away. Luke's going to come on like... Ten- <laughs> <laughs> Luke's going to come on like 10 minutes after you're gone. And I'm like, ah, oh, shit. So... Well, uh, we will have some more. We will have some more chats. So that's why another reason why we started this very early. All right. So we have. Um, let me get in here. Uh, Mike uh, or or Alan or Anna, shoot one away. Well, I'm looking through chat. Uh, someone asked in chat earlier if you are still in touch with any of the old TSR crew. Um, if they're on Facebook, probably. But uh, a lot of those people, of course, <clears throat> played in Gygax's game in, in Lake Geneva, and I, I can't commute 80 miles to go play in a game once a week. At least, you know, sorry, no. But um, I talked to a few people. I, 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 um, what's his name? Scott Duncan showed up. Now, Scott Duncan is um, uh, was the president of um, International Federation of War Games, and he's still alive and well. Uh, and I talked to him, and it's how I got into gaming. My first Avalon Hill game was Gettysburg on Squares, as oh, opposed geez. to Gettysburg yeah, on. I gotta tell me, I gotta get back. Okay. <laughs> Sit on another screen. Okay. Duh. I'm sorry. My apologies. Um. Do you still run or play in a game? No. Okay. And uh, that retro gamer meth is the individual who I said to him, Mike, I said, you were going to start a Greyhawk campaign, get L1, even though it says two to five on it. And I'm going to talk about this on Sunday's Gabin too, with a, uh, you can, you can do it at first level. There's a lot of uh, stuff on the outskirts and it's a great, and I think you agree with me. It was the right call. It's great. It's a great module. I love it. Well, when, when I di- when we diced up characters and we started L one, I would roll for experience points already earned, and um, I would run a range that your experience points were somewhere between one and four thousand. So you had to be very, very, very lucky to get thirty five hundred or more. You really had to get lucky. Because it was uh, die percent times die 10 or some variation of that. Or die 20. Die 20 times die percent. Uh, But I wanted to give you a leg up. I wanted the party, let's say party of seven, to have a couple of characters that were second level. Because they would be the backbone of any melee that would show and it would also allow you to have maybe some second level. You almost never got magic in your next second level, but you certainly got clerics in it. And having those extra spells for uh, 13 and 14 wisdom would save a lot of people's butts. Um, 
So I like to bolster the party in that way. Um, and usually somebody would roll in the ballpark of, what is it, 1250 to 2500. That will take you to second level, uh, depending upon the class. Uh, the thief would be pretty easy because even at 1250, isn't there? And clerics are twelve fifty. Thieves were fifteen, I think. Yeah. Or, 50 or, 50, or vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. And then fighters are two thousand. Yeah. Um, and then the the ranger is a little bit higher, and the paladin is a little bit higher. I, I discouraged paladins. And if you wanted to be a paladin, I'd say, Do you really want to be a paladin? Do you want to be that self-centered stuff shirt? No. <laughs> <clears throat> um, paladins are pain in the ends. But they, they were, they, they were, every now and then a player would come up with something. He would go into town and he'd throw copper pennies to the children. And I'd say, oh, now that's worth the reward. That's worth 50 <laughs> points or 75 experience points. <laughs> You're doing something in class that um, rewards people. And you should you take care of the kids, get them, you know, because they don't get to go somewhere and buy a donut. <laughs> they just don't. They're lucky to have stale bread. So you give them a few copper pennies, and my goodness, they eat that. Yeah. Um, Scott Casper, that was funny. Too much paladin hate. <laughs> <laughs> not not but, hate. Let's yeah. just say. Yeah. Let's just say. Just stain. Uh, yeah. just, well, you can do it. I had one person who played the paladin. It was one of the nice ones. Well, I, I had my, my players always play multiple characters. Always. And um, every now and then I would start up a new party just to bring in additional people. And now on one occasion, they didn't realize that they were in a tavern with themselves. And they didn't get along with one another. And it was almost ready to break out in the melee. And I said, you know, you don't recognize that guy, do you? I said, no. I said, it's you, you dumbass. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah, well. So I want to get to this before you have to depart, and that is um, Josh Pop has really done a great job on putting this together. Josh, thank <laughs> you. This adventure that was run at CAFCON that you put together, uh, Ravages of the Mind, and it's in a module format now, almost complete, right? We just need to lay a kill map, correct? Correct. Wow. Um, so you No, know, you don't need to lay a kill map. Okay. The Laekeo map is there for you to dice up new characters, but it provides the backdrop. You need the maps for the the, uh, the ruins of the Temple of Lurg, and the the guy who's in charge of the Temple of Lurg is worshiping. I think a demon. I think I, I put him in charge. I had a demon take care of him. And um, he is capable of taking on lair bear form. But then he better not run into Lurg because Lurg can command lair bears in the service, regardless of their alignment. So, um, yeah, you want the adventure and the maps that go with the adventure. That's the ravages of the mind. Um, he goes into um, the town of Laekeo. Very rarely he'd go in for supplies, and now and then he'd treat himself to a glass of good wine as opposed to the swill he bought back and, and would drink for a few uh, few weeks till he was gone. And he saw this woman, and it looked like his wife who was killed, and it looked like his daughter who was killed. And he took them on as being his wife and daughter, so he decided to kidnap. And that's the basis for the ravages of the mind. So, wow. Yeah, and uh, it, yeah, it, it's kind of uh, it's kind of disturbing a bit, but that's a great adventure written. All right, so the question everyone wants to know. 
This is over yeah. 100 pages of content, right? This is the layer yeah. Yeah. When is this good? When will you make this available? Oh, you have that now. This... Uh, I, 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 once I get the map, I'm hoping Anna will publish it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, field plus. And if it's published in multiple places, that's fine as long as I have first serialization right. Of course. Okay. All right. Josh is aware of this, right? Because he did all this work on this, uh, so setting this up and all, and he's he's he's, he's aware. Uh, he's on now, so, by the way. So Zarathon mm -hmm. is on. So that is good news. It's That's over a hundred. Uh, just for the detail in here, it's not like hundred ten pages. It's insane. Yeah. It's a old yeah. town or yeah, I'm yeah. prolific. That's so fantastic. <laughs> all right, a couple more quick questions, and then we'll decide who's the winner here. Um, so. To, did you have any thoughts about the Soul Imperium? <laughs> no. There you go, Jason. It's just flat out no. No, uh, just a zero. A Soul album. Imperium. Oh, you mean from from the original, what, what, back when they were? Yeah. Um, yeah, before they were. Before the Sea of Dust. Yeah. Yeah, they, they gave up on a lot of that shit as they moved across the country. So, you know, you had the Sewell show up in the barbarian states. You had him show up in Raddick. You had him show up in the Scarlet Brothers, maybe. Yeah? And then you had him show up on Lindor Isle. Uh, but they have little enclaves here and there. Uh, but those were the big ones where a bunch of people ended up. Uh, so I, I took the liberty of making all of the humans in on the in uh, on uh, Lindor Isle, I gave them Sewell gods. Uh, now there should be some meridians there. Too bad there should be, but I didn't do it. And certainly, if somebody wants to go in and take Fred and Harvey and, and whatever and say well, this guy worships an Iridian god, that's fine because you're more familiar with the Iridian gods than I. Am. And uh, I didn't use them. Um, do you have a do you have a TSR like most prized possession like something that's like the top like that's my penultimate um, accomplishment or item or that was another question well, from the audience. I have the autographed copies of the Dungeon Master's Guide to Player's Handbook by Gigan. That's good. <laughs> that's something that will will go to Luke if if things go wrong at some point in time. Okay. Um. So that, that's the reason I need the two of them to come out to the house so I can show them where all the stuff is, 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 as opposed to having it go into a dumpster. Yeah, so yeah, the don't... pandemics are, are over or kind of subsided a bit. So, yeah. 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 With a little luck, I'll live a couple of years, but I don't know. Um, I mean, leukemia is not the thing you want to have. You're, I think you look like you're doing great for. Yeah, not you know. Yeah, you know. I, I'm, in, I'm yeah. in remission. I'm in remission. That's great. Yeah. And then we have this coronavirus sitting on top of us. Yeah. It's, it's, yep. it's insane. It's absolutely freaking insane. Yep. It is It is definitely scary. Um, no, yeah, yeah. I'm trying and to. Then, and then you watch these people that are out there say, you know, give me my freedom. I. I I want to be next to my buddy. Well, go ahead, kiss him. Maybe one of you will die. <laughs> um, the problem so, is they're going to go back and kill their relative. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, they're finding out now that uh, it does damage to your brain. It does damage to your organs. Even if you survive it, Ugh. you've got yep. the possibility of that something that you're going to stick around with you the rest of your life. Yep. So how can you possibly congregate face-to-face and not look at the facts. Before you go, I want to I want to give uh, everyone to know some credit that you don't get that you you wrote a lot in the player's handbook and didn't get credit for it. Correct. Correct. Dungeon Master's Guide. In the foreword it says there's stuff in there by me. Yes. Dungeon Master's Guide. Yes, and the player's handbook. And the player's handbook. Um, There are a lot of monsters in Monster Manual 2 that are mm -hmm. in Bone Hill that mm -hmm. are originals, like the Spectator, the Stone Guardian, right? They're yeah. all 
Uh, they're all yours that you were created. Um, the Skelter and the Zombier, which I don't know why they never went beyond L, 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 L1. They're, they're wonderful. I love them as special undead. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of guys there's a, and gals watching. There's a lot of data that just is... Leonard, oh. is, yeah, go ahead, Leonard. Yeah. Well, I've created monsters in uh, L4 and L5. You know, if you look in there, there's stuff I've created. Certainly, I keep creating magic items like there's no, no tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff in there that you can pick up and, and use. Um, oh, and there's a lot of great magic items in L4 and L5, guys, on Dragon Dragon's Foot. I use a lot of them. They're cool. They're cool items. They're not overpowered, but they're gadgety. They're like kind of got quirks to them. Yeah, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're neat. They're neat stuff. So uh, please check that out as well. Definitely on there. But you know, it's it's a lot of accomplishments. Um, you know, uh, anyone up here want to ask Leonard a, a last question or comment or say something? Go ahead. We're getting near the. We're getting. Near I know. The, that's why I'm rushing it out here. <laughs> Just a quick one on, uh, you did a lot of work in your early design work around diplomacy. and You were really involved with diplomacy oh, yeah, yeah. back in the day. Mm -hmm. So what what are your thoughts on how playing diplomacy relates to like high level characters establishing strongholds and domain management? It doesn't. Okay. Um, because <laughs> you had players in diplomacy who would build lines of, of um, provinces that supported other provinces and created a line which you couldn't possibly attack. Now, in my diplomacy history, um, we had, um, you know, you had the Boardman numbers, which were originally uh, from John Boardman, and then later on somebody else did assigned the number. Which you said, I'm going to do a game, so you were 1973 AA. BC or whatever the hell that may be. And <clears throat> I did a lot of stuff with that. And uh, according to the records, I was the first person who built four in Russia. I have that record deep in, in my... Yeah, I had to stab three different people. But sure happens, you know. I, I stabbed Germany and Turkey and somebody <laughs> else, all in the same same move. And I said, oh, it's because they're telling me that they're, you're about to invade me, so I'll, I'll back off. Wow. And they fell for it. So I think I know who I want to win to win the uh, the dagger so far. So I don't know if you guys, but I think that the Blood, Blood Wild underscore SW with the question about uh, where he got his start in role playing was the best one. I don't know what you all yeah. think. Yeah, I think that's. Anna right. thinks that too. Yep, yep, I liked it. Alan, Mike, you sure. There you go. All right, Blood Wild underscore SW. Uh, that Josh uh, says that as well. So uh, I, um, whisper me your address, and I'll get it to Leonard, and you will get a, a really relic. It's thirty years old from a, from a run fair that uh, you know uh, with from the great Leonard Lakofka. Yes, there you go, man. So really appreciate you uh, coming on and being a sub too, Leonard. I know, I know. Uh, uh, you know, our time is always fleeting. I appreciate you coming on. We're going to keep the discussion going on this end because yeah. Luke may be popping on, and, and we want to. We don't want to be offline when he's like eventually uh, tries to come on. But anything uh, you'd like to say in closing, Leonard? Well, well, you know, you've been, this is like your third official time. It doesn't count the time you hopped on right in the middle of the of the broadcast. That was hysterical, man. That, night, that, that was, was awesome. awesome. But, yep. you know, you're welcome on any time. And uh, you're welcome yep. to, uh, you know, we'll hopefully have you back again to chat up some more. Because we're getting more and more viewers now. We're really starting to roll now. And we're getting a lot of people who didn't watch the first two times. So I'm really, I'm really happy to have you uh, on. I think everyone... Sure say the same thing so um yeah it's yeah. great to meet you for the first time virtually yeah. Yeah. all right arrivederci all right leonard we'll see you soon okay Bye. thank you and we'll, we'll we're gonna thank keep this chat so going so leonard we got him for an hour and 20 minutes which is pretty yep. good and that's mm -hmm. why we always start early actually leonard came on at like 7 15 and couldn't get couldn't get connected 
And then you know the, you know how you have those mute the mute and you have the he had them the X's were through them. So they just press that button. But but uh yes. So let's keep this. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't realize you're starting early, uh Jay, I would have <laughs> uh, okay. earlier, but I, I was feeding the family. That's okay. <laughs> I, I forewarned everyone Leonard gets when he gets on, he wants to get going. And so I just yep. you know, I, that's why it's okay. we we got we got him for an hour hour twenty is about average that we get him for. Yep. So so that was that was great. Um, why don't we talk some more about some homages? Uh, Alan, do you got a favorite article? Um, and, and you can all jump in. A favorite article out of Dragon that you like of Leonard's? Me, of Leonard's. Oh, yeah. goodness. There's so many good ones. Um, I would need a list. I'm going to. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I'm going to show you he, the one. He I was like. the first one to do the dragon damage changes, I yes. think. Um, yeah, that's true. He, he, I think he did them before the big set that were done in Dragon 50, because uh, his was like in 42 or whatever, um, in Layman's Tiny Hut, of course. Yeah, so that uh, that was always Monsters cool. How Strong is Strong, is that it? That's 44. No, no that, that's one around uh, actually raiding Oh, here it is. Sort of like the old Monster Mark. Dragon raiding, 38. Like oh, the Anti-Paladin Dragon. Uh, rearranging and redefining the Mighty Dragon. So that's uh, Dragon 38. Uh, yeah. Now, now, everyone, uh, you see Katana Lafavi, who's on now in chat. He uh, has these posted on his Facebook, uh, the compilation of Dragon's Foot uh, and um, and and Dragon Magazine, uh, almost a bibliography. If you want this, okay. that's that's where yeah, uh, where to get it. Um, I just I basically just snipped them right off of there, I just, you know, in a JPEG. So. Um, for all those, I'm going to say this one. I like, I like the uh, eclectic stuff, and we added a stat to thievery because of Leonard. And let me go over this. I love, of course, the archer, and I love the deathmaster. This is a little bit of a uh, one that you may not know, and it's called the thief a special look. Hmm. All right, so. Uh, let me try and get this so that it uh, from the best of dragon version. <laughs> yeah, this is the best of dragon version uh, on this one. Um, hopefully that doesn't. Let me just um, make sure that it doesn't move. Uh, so try, okay. So what Leonard describes here in this article is there's a stat that's missing. There's an ability that's missing in thieves. And that ability is you have fine remove traps, you have open locks, you don't have set traps, which should be different because it it should be a, a little bit easier, but it should be based on some different criteria. So he sets up, and you can see that in the next, um, and this is originally Dragon 47? Yes, Dragon 47, yeah. this is initially, okay? Um, and here's the ch here's the chart. And we use this to this day. So people that play in my game, you go, what the hell is a set traps ability? That's what this is. So we use this for thieves. We use this for assassins. We use this for our bounty hunters. We use this for bandits outside. We use this for Grugach. You know, we use it for a lot of different things, right? So uh, it's a, it's something. Yeah, see, see, Casey's like, ah, what is it? There you go, Casey. That's what it is. It's Leonard's. <laughs> it's Leonard's. Yes. It's it's a Leonard thing that we use to this day, and it it, it, it really uh, is uh, it's worthwhile. It's, you know, it's, it, the chart's all you need. The chart right there. So, okay, and that's one of my favorites. It's just like wow, we added an entire new ability that we've been using. When was forty seven published, Alan? Do you know? Was it eighty two? Oh gracious! 80, uh, let's see. No, yeah, it would have been in the eighty one, eighty two range. Yes. Yeah. My first issue is what sixty sixty three and fifty eight. So, yeah. So, this is as old as my campaign, you know, and we started, I th I'm going to say we started using this, I'm going to guess 83 is when we really started using this. We used the Archer uh, almost right from when the article came out, um, and we've made some minor changes to it, but that was the first published class in a book, in a magazine. <laughs> Now, you know, we made up our own bounty hunter, but the but the the archer was right out of almost verbatim, right out of the article. Yeah. So, uh, Dragon Forty Six is from uh, February eighty one. Okay, yeah, yep, absolutely. So, missile fire in the archer subclass is Dragon Forty Five. So that this is like the glory golden era of, of in my opinion, of the dragon oh, yeah. up up to one hundred. Um, so, Alan, do you have any? Uh, Reminiscence of anything that you utilize, it was Leonard's. 
Yeah, so um, he, I, I ran across his pyrologist class at some point um, through discussion online about it. And uh, it had come up, uh, it was published in his uh, diplomacy zine. Uh, and I can't pronounce it because I don't know French real well, but it's like Liaison Dangerousies or something like that. Yes. Um, and then it, but it had also been published in uh, a Chicago gaming club zine called The Wizard. Uh, oh. So he had that in there and he had another piece. Um, so the Pyrologist was actually co-written with Gary. Oh, really? Um, uh, so, and that, these are like way back in like 77. Um, so they're they're quite a bit earlier, um, but uh, yeah, there was an article on the pyrologist in uh, the Wizard Number Three, and then he had an article on cre how to create and manufacture magic items, uh, which were the first real rules, kind of formalizing that for D and D that had been published at that point. Since that predates the DMG by two years plus, so. So the pyrologist is really neat. It's a, it's a cool specialist. And he's got some interesting uh, uh, interesting spells in there that you can you know sort of add into you know regular spell lists stuff like that. How much different is that from an, a fire elementalist? Is it because uh, I have never read it? Conceptually, I really it's really it's this yeah. I mean, it's a fire specialist wizard, you know, evocation specialist. Uh, so you know, it's just a very very early example of that kind. That of thing. is cool. I, I haven't read that one. I need to. The Cloistered Cleric's another huge one. Yeah. You know, uh, I didn't even realize that until uh, Gitano put this together that it was his. I didn't even realize that. That's a that big was in thing. Dragon 58, I think, which was my first my first issue. Uh, it, it's a great... Or maybe he had new spells in that one. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah it's, six, it's 68. It, beefing up the Cleric okay. is 58, That's and right. then, yeah, Cloistered Cleric is 68. Um, but... Uh, because you're like, who do you go to the who do you go to get healing in town from? You know, <laughs> uh, Cloister Clark for the most part. You know, so uh, it was great. It was a great concept. Mike, any uh, any thoughts on uh, Leonard influences in your in your games? <laughs> well, <laughs> Leonard did the Sewell guys. Yes, yeah. all of them. That's where I came into Dragon Magazine. Interestingly, I didn't start collecting until like around issue eighty something. So those maybe I don't know if it was just 87. an accident or intentionally I was looking for Greyhawk articles I don't know, but those Sewell God articles were definitely one of the things that kept me subscribing for. I think I, I had a subscription all the way until like somewhere in the middle of three five when I just got ridiculous. Right. But, okay. Yeah. The. Um... They are some awesome deities. Oh, yeah. Uh, and there's I mean, so much more detail and flavor in them than the rest of the gods. A little disappointing because I thought it, they would keep it going. And, you know, because surely there were more that they didn't do. Well, yeah. from Leonard, I mean, you, you've heard that. And this is the first time I think you've heard it, Mike, is the T Tiamat Bahamut thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, a lot of people don't know that. And uh, I have the chart here. Let's see if I can find it. I know I have it here. Here's the chart for all his deities, and uh, can you make it big? <laughs> uh, can you give no, me a I second? And I can. <laughs> I got a code. Uh, I don't want to crash the stream. Oh, no, no, let's, no, 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 no. I, I bet you I can do this on the fly. So let's keep on talking here. But he has a chart that is really genius on all this. And uh, let me just find uh, the Gavin uh, subfolder box. And uh, hopefully I can do this without, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, LL Legends of Wars 47. I bet you I can put these on that 11th. Um, as long as I, okay. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to have to switch to this now. And let's pray, guys. I don't uh, crash Feminist everything Feminist. here. I think it'll be okay. I'm going to put these in um, Lender Gods and Notes. And uh, they're not in any specific order because I just put them in right away. And let's see what comes up. That one's going to be sideways. That's his note. Look at that. That is his. Uh, yeah, that I can't straighten. That's his original notes on all the gods. That, yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's his original notes. Okay, sorry it's sideways on that, but the rest of the stuff will be fine because it's uh, long ways. But look, it says, let's say, Lendor, uh, Korg, uh, Associate Animals, Girl, or Ape. I mean, he's. this is the detail going back to. Uh, 
to his original days. And even Aquaman is on there. So, uh, you know, he talks about <laughs> all, right. all right, here you go. There you go. It's nice and blown up. There, there, there it is. So, uh, that one I think I've seen in some form before. Okay. Yeah. The other one I hadn't seen. Yeah. Uh, he uh, shared that with me, uh, I think, on show one, wasn't it, Anna? Yeah. The first he show. He sent it out to us. At the yeah. Gallon. No, he sent, sent this it. stuff to us five yep. minutes before we we're going to start that night. Yep. And I was like, uh, you should have said, oh, I know, I just found this stuff. Yeah. Yep. But here's, all the, here's all the lesser deities, and it's got, you know, he's got his great color codings in there, and he's got all his... Uh, all the deities and the, the relationships. And then the last page, he's got Aquaman and uh, Bahamut and Tiamat and all, all their uh, all their notations on that. Yeah, I think what I liked about those articles was it, it had a lot of the ones that aren't household names, Jazz Car and so yeah. forth, uh, for Tubo. And I knew about those. I retain those in my memory. But if I had asked any of my friends and players they ever heard of him no no and but that's that's okay because you know uh we're we're of a different le you know yeah. knowledge base like my right. my players but i really them. like mythology i think that's what grabbed me was the mythologies yeah and he made the he made the gods really come alive in those articles in terms of like you know yeah. the clerics had powers that were different and he talked about where the churches were which i thought was really yeah. cool yeah that helped and he uh, continued it because he has a, um, and uh, he tells the story of, uh, earlier that Lurg was named Grell, but Grell was a monster, so he just yeah. flipped it. It was G R E L L, made it L L E R G. Uh, yeah, that's mind blowing. Yeah, yeah, and Gary said no problem, so he flipped it, and that's how it's Lurg. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, and. Um, that temp that temple right uh, Josh is in uh, Laekiel in the in the uh, uh, in the the adventure ravages the mind correct Josh I believe that's the temple he puts in in detail yeah, I think into so. yeah, yeah okay he mentioned Lurg earlier okay, yeah Lurg yeah yep so and Lurg and Cord are similar but not Lurg's more animal like and Cord's more nor like Viking like is that make is that kind of or, or yeah. yeah. Yeah, and 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 Cord's like the god who transcends the parents kind of thing too, which is interesting, you know, because he's more powerful than one. Or, I think both of his parents, maybe even, okay. or I guess, yeah. And who are Cord's parents? Well, now I'm trying to remember. I think it was Lendor, and then maybe it was, no, but it might have been two Cyril, lesser gods. Cyril and Falcon. And Falcon. Falcon, I think. Okay. Falcon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That so he's bad. a greater god, and they're both lesser gods. Yeah, I, I always thought was cool. Mm, yeah. Put that together. Yeah, but he has a popular, <laughs> cool portfolio too, so it kind of yeah. appeals to. Cord. It's, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. This I, is more of a setting gripe, but Cord's also one of these gods that I uh, a lot, and I think this is true of a lot of the ones that are in Dragon Magazine. They do go to Orth all the time. Cord is a classic yeah. like Greek god. He, yeah, sleep has lots of kids. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like Cuthbert I, and, and a few others that that kind of. Right. I don't know where this later thing came along where the gods aren't allowed on the prime material plane. Yeah, because, that was something that that kind of yeah. Yeah, because that's clearly contradicting yeah. first edition. Yeah. Probably someone realized it's not good for mechanics no. and gameplay to have gods no. come, coming around and players killing them. But it's them definitely. Or classic mythology oh yeah definitely diverse. that's part of, of almost yeah. every mythology is that yeah. the gods come down and, and screw yeah. up the people who don't believe in them or people do believe in them or, or something so yeah mm -hmm. so uh, th these soul deities make great specialty priests because mm. of all the abilities <laughs> so i have a specialty priest of ouija made up and they get she gets they get necromancer spells at, to a limited extent, which is cool. And we just the last one I made up was Falcon, Falcon, however you say it. It's an interesting specialty priest because in the one book it states if they melee they can only use daggers. That's it, no other weapon. But they can use all sorts of bows. They're like they're basically they're not specialized, but they get pluses to hit with all bows. So it's a really interesting specialty priest class, um, and I love the way that that that, that detail goes with uh, with uh, all the the soul ones. I think uh, we have Jormy as well uh, as one too. So um, 
a kind of uh, trying to get my guys into utilizing more of these deities in Greyhawk, you know, because um, they are very rich, definitely. Yeah, it's fun. I, I'm negotiating this paladin that I mentioned earlier. I'm trying to kind of get added to this campaign as a new character uh, with our with the DM. So we're kind of going back and forth on, okay, so, you know, does, the, does this paladin detect chaos instead of evil, maybe? Uh, things like that. Well, go back to my um, my Inquisitor, uh, Lawful Neutral. They detect chaos, and they're protected right. from chaos. I think it's, yeah, I think that's the way to go with it. Because uh, what, the Ouija is Lawful Neutral with a tinge of evil. So you have, make a true Lawful Neutral uh, Paladin type. You have, you know, give them some... Uh, yeah, my, my DM's too classical. Paladin still has to be Lawful Good. So oh, I, I, I've okay. got a... It's going to be a Lawful Good Worshipper of Ouija's, which has some interesting additional... <laughs> yeah. Well, it, those things can be worked out, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, fun. Yeah. You know, and I think, you know, to your point earlier, Mike, you know, the those articles really kind of encourage that kind of cracking open the design box to play with those pieces and parts of the of the gods, the clerics. Gary Holian makes a good point. Cyril is criminally underused as a villain foil. Ah, yes. I agree 100%. It's either you're going to Ayus or Narol or even Orcus or whoever, but he, you're absolutely correct uh, on, on that. So um, that uh, great point there, Gary. Absolutely. You guys, feel free. I mean, we're still taking questions too. Uh, so Anna, do you have favorite uh, yeah. Len stuff? Not really. It's it's. I'm very much like Mike. It was the, the writings of, of the gods and the kind of cultural influences and mm -hmm. stuff. I never played on on Lindor Isle. I haven't you never made it over there, so I haven't played right. the the any of the L series. Stuff, I almost so. feel bad because yep. I did not own any of the L modules till prob because I started collecting later. Probably not till third edition. I just didn't have them. So yeah. I didn't really know much about Len's writing back then. I knew he did the Soul God articles, but back then I didn't really like have authors I followed in particular. I was more drawn to the art. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so I, I kind of miss that whole thing with the uh, going to Lendor Isles and play the L series and stuff. I never I never got into to that. That was one remote island way out millions of miles away from forever in my campaign so it's a bit like like jay had never been over in in great kingdom area and stuff so i never made it over to <laughs> the door isles so to speak so yeah let's just say this i moved them let's oh, not, let's not on now. See, that's not that's not what i do if, if I, I i run places and, and and i don't run modules per se but i i read i had a few of i think i had the l no i had definitely l2 i think i have the l1 too in some shape or form somewhere back in the day and and the the um but i never ran them as intended but they were really part i read them through when i did the map the first time that's like 10 12 years ago and and then thankfully when i moved here i started i saw that Lennon was on facebook and stuff so we started emailing and and and, and contacted each other on facebook a bit then i realized that we only lived a few miles from each other and, and closer to each other than we now we live like 50 miles or like no or about 35 miles away from each other so so we've been talking but there's always been something going in and now we have the pandemic it means that i can pop over but it will happen one day yeah <clears throat> all right so so yeah um that's a question for next time uh uh for leonard how do you feel about the fact that people keep moving the location of your l series thanks thanks man you get me in trouble <laughs> that's, 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 that's a good, good that's question. a real good one yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. let me say let me say something about this if you go back to like an old old gab i think it's eight or nine where we go the next row of and this was the one that was either this or or uh, uh oh my god my see I'm, i am getting old um the red one near harby Ghost Tower of Inverness. It was either this okay. or Ghost Tower of Inverness that was going on the wall. And this one got cut. It was the last one. This is not easy to run to DM. Oh, yeah. This, yeah, Alan, they'll tell you, running an Assassin's Guild and keeping track of all those characters is not an easy thing. This is like one of the first day-to-day -day what is going on day one, day oh. two, day three adventures. There's I've a schedule. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this was really uh, detailed. And if you love that as far as a DM... 
the, uh, you got to give this a shot. It reminds me of uh, what's the one with the three houses, the B series one, House Radu, House. Um, oh my God! It was a B four, B five. It's similar to that. Yeah. Oh <clears throat> God! Has, on the hill. It has That's three five. Uh, it has three different houses. The veiled, the veiled. Oh, veiled society. Veiled societies like that too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's difficult to run that, that way. So yeah, run that one. Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the the interesting things with the L series and and Lindor Isle is that it's like a micro setting. It's it's you you yeah. can play campaigns and you can develop and 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 read through all that and it's it's a self contained little universe, kind of attached or semi attached to Greyhawk. So it's it's culturally attached and history and and gods and stuff like that. But you can run it as a separate. So if you want your little sandbox that that the players or the characters have a difficulty escaping from, you can kind of run. I think in, in an island adventure like that is 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 I think a great idea and and, and I'm I'm now amazed that I've, when I've read the stuff that how much Leonard had been able to insert into that little island that is well yeah. it's a couple hundred miles long and and it's probably about 150 by almost 200 miles by by 200 miles almost and it's it's a weird most one of the most weirdest shaped islands I've ever seen. Someone said it looks like a bird taking off with the wings flapping or something, but we'll see. <laughs> And and it's kind of it's 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 an interesting little microcosm that you can you can really use as a mini setting for, for your players. One thing yeah, I, I think those kinds of regional settings like that that are kind of plug and play are really an underrepresented kind of design. Yeah. In mm -hmm. in modules, source yep. books, things like that. They're either gigantic campaign settings mm -hmm. or they're in the core of the campaign world, like you know, yeah. your Furiandi area for the Marklands mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. And you kind of can't not deal with them then. But these yeah. plug and play pieces that are kind of regional regional areas are, are really great. It's a great sweet spot. Yeah, and, and and I often thought if I go into design if uh, a campaign world from scratch, I will design it as a bunch of islands that are a couple hundred miles across, like four or five hundred miles. Put them far away enough that you can kind of have them as separate entities. You can pick one or or, or many, and and you mm -hmm. can have as much or a little interaction as you want. So they can. Oh, I love that type of island with that. You can just plug it into to your. I'm I'm surprised that there is not more publishers that have picked that up because it is kind of a, a cool concept. You can take land. Or Isles with its ventures and basically put it wherever you want. Uh, good question. Uh, so Mike Saxon asked that, placing it wherever you want. Was there other stuff written for other islands? Well, Isle of Dread is one I could think of. And you... <clears throat> Yes, Isle of Dread. And Isle of Dread is one of these that is kind of semi-Greyhawk because it's X1. one of these things that could be kind of anywhere that, that mm -hmm. got shoehorned into Greyhawk and probably shoehorned <clears throat> in a bunch of other settings too. I ran it in Karamikos. Uh-huh. Yeah, or because yeah. it came with the with the expert uh, set box. Yeah. Yeah. Do you? Uh, I don't think so. Um, one of the things that we did not get to was Leonard's um, article he wrote in Earth Journal Ten about the life of Leomond. I suggest yeah. you guys go into uh, go on Greyhawk Online and download Earth Journal Ten um, right now. And this is a great. It's like in first person or whatever you call it, third-person perspective. He's talking about his, Liam is talking about himself in this article that uh, that Leonard wrote. It's probably about 20 years old. And um, so uh, if you want some detail, uh, Liam was born on Fireseek the Third in 479 CY. Okay, it's right in here. <clears throat> Do we know where he was born? Uh, I believe on on Lendor. Mother took ship in the Spindrift. Oh, wait a minute. Mother lived, uh -huh. I, wait a minute. Mother lived in Iron Gate. For a couple of years after I was born, but I remember nothing of the city, and she told me very little. My oh. guess is the Celadon Forest was where he was born, since she once said she lived in B2 in the kingdom of Niron for a dozen or more years. Okay, so he thinks mm -hmm. uh, he's like one one eighth elven or one quarter elven, okay. and um, he really hops around over time. And he has a thing; he has a beef with the Scarlet Brotherhood. Okay, he's a, he's a which is interesting yeah. because the, the, culturally they shouldn't have beefs with each other, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he is a, considers himself a full blooded soul human, but he does not uh, like the Scarlet Brotherhood at all. Yeah. And at the very end of the article, because uh, he's alive, he's like 111 years old as of the writing of this, um, he's back in the spindrifts. 
And and he says that uh, I'll be more visible in the next few years if the damn assassins from the Scarlet Brotherhood don't catch up with me. So and then you know goes on. It's good. It's really cool. So I would recommend it, guys and gals, to take a look at it, at it and read it uh, at your leisure. Um, did a, a nice uh, a nice job with it. Just give you a, an idea of what's going on uh, in the life of Leomond and why he's like was he was part of the Citadel of Eight, right, Al? Not the Circle ever. Uh, I don't think he was part of either. No? Okay. Okay. I don't think he was part of the Citadel of Eight in okay. the original. What's the question? Then. Is Leomond? Leomond part yeah. of the Citadel of Eight at all? Or the Circle of Eight? I think in Age of Worms, the Paizo group made Leomond part of the Circle. Like an early... Oh, okay. Yeah. And then he okay. went off to other planes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think he did. Uh, did he go that to another a, plane or did he? Die? He went to Dearth, which is an, another Earth D Y R T H. According to, I don't even know about that one. Well, it's, a, it's in a, it's in that <laughs> article. <laughs> That's a Leonardism. <laughs> yeah, Liam might have been mooted uh, as a member, I mean, a five member. Obviously, not by Len. Okay, well, that's okay, Gary. I mean, you know. Uh, so a, a, a real quick funny story. He sent me all, and uh, Tim and my group all knows. Uh, oh, you redeemed a hero. You redeemed a hero point now. Oh my gosh! Well, that's for tomorrow night. So uh, <laughs> I got to remember that. So Fleisch, thank you, man. So he, he he gave me all these like ruined buildings, and they're like pieces of buildings there from one company, uh, uh, Norse Foundry, I think it was. They're made out of mm -hmm. dental plaster, so they're they're really cool, but they're very they can be brittle. So yeah. Bill put them all together and painted them. I said, "Hey, hey, let's let's take one, and on the front of it is this big wall. I want you to scroll. Liam and was here on it in red, right? Mm -hmm. And let Leonard get a kick out of it, like Kilroy. <laughs> exactly. So I still have it, and then I showed Leonard, and he he wasn't amused at all by it. <laughs> he was not amused. He's like." Um, yeah, that's not something that Liam would have even, you know, I was like, oh, I was try trying to pay homage was, to his guy. It was such a cool idea. Yeah, yeah and he's like, right. he didn't like it at all, so that, yeah. that's a funny yeah. one. Oh my gosh. All right, so uh, Josh has a big, in Circle of Eight, was founded in 571 by Morning Canaan. Among the group's original members were Bigby, Buckner, Drawmage, Liam and Nistel, Otto, and Rari. In 574, Liam and left to explore other planes and was replaced by former Citadel member Tensor. Cool. Wow. Uh, where was that noted from Josh? That information is that, uh, can you re sounds like from the what Living Greyhawk Journal number zero, maybe the the insert one that was in Dragon? And so stuff. it's cat, it's it's published source then, if it is, right? Well, that makes sense, yeah, yeah. That's not what EGG but said. But that's definitely not Lens, yeah. That's yeah. not Len but, or yeah. or Gary Gaga's puppet dad. You're absolutely correct. Um, uh, all right, so it's from a, from a fandom.com wiki, so we're not sure if that's uh, if that's canon or uh, well, I went on regular Wikipedia and it says that Odaluk replaced Leomund, so who knows? Yeah, okay, so there's some conjecture there, and uh, it's okay, yeah. um, but um, it's cool to have it. Let me think about this. It, okay, it, here we go. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Ooh, okay, good. Now I'm just gonna look her up. <laughs> Yes. Yes, Casey. Exactly. Where is he? He's like, man, he's like a walking. Yeah. So Eric Mona kept track of that very quickly, according to. That's a good question. So if we ever get Eric Mona on this show, like we like he said, <laughs> uh, we can ask we him to, that kind of yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. need to we need to work on that. We do need to work on. Yeah. yeah. We got some great announcements, by the way, everyone. So, um, well, uh, uh oh. Uh oh. No, 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 no. Oh. Yeah, the, the, Alan answers yes. I, I saw something. I was like, oh, it's probably Luke saying he can't come on, but it was it was from <laughs> it was, I was like, oh my god, I got a message, but it wasn't from Luke. So we're just gonna hang a little bit more and, and chat out and do our announcements at nine forty five. And if he comes on, he comes on. And if he doesn't, hey, it's been a great show anyway. So, yep. um, let me think here. Some things that I would um, have loved to see Leonard continue on. How about that? Uh, this article, Specialization in Game Balance on, number, on what uh, Dragon 104, 
it's a good article, um, and, and he loves for single but not double. And I always, how do you pull something back, like Alan, Mike, Anna, once you give it to a character, to the players? Do you use double at all, Alan, still? No, I don't have, I don't use specialization at all. Okay, so you're, you're a In the current game. In the current game, in yeah. current game. okay. Okay. Yeah. What about uh, Anna, Anna? Everyone specialized in three point five and path five. Oh yeah, they, no. they, <laughs> there's so many many different things, and 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 you can you can kind of add since you have feats that you can specialize in all sorts of ways. So yeah, I remember using player's option back when I was doing second edition. The specializations got ridiculous in that. Yeah, because it was like specialization and like master, grandmaster. Just there was no end to it. Yeah. Well, uh, did you ever play Boulder's Gate 2? I mean, you could specialize like up to five times in that. Click, 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 click. I was yeah. like, oh, this is, well, that's Forgotten Realms, though. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's they seem to different... have reined it in both in, in 5e and Pathfinder 2. They, they seem to have balanced the math that went haywire because when you leveled up, you just, things just inflated up continuously. And, and, and both the 5e and, and Pathfinder 2 seems to have put kind of a they, they put the math into into place so now they, they actually works from level one to level 20 so it's kind of doesn't go overboard even, but even when you add things like feats and, and and other special abilities and stuff you don't go crazy with it so yeah so it but the third edition was fun and, and pf1 that era was awesome fun with all the stuff but you had to be wary because if characters super specialized then but usually comes back and bite them because you you get specialized so when you meet the right type of target then you will be invincible but you just have to have a wider world and and then the specialized characters usually end up it's it's not fun so to speak if you're the master at killing vampires then then the world is not full of vampires so 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 in my campaigns a little bit of jack of all trade characters have an edge over time than than super specialized ones compared to to organized play then then when you meet a lot of these special monsters way more than just regular joes that that had are more kind of generally just beefed up so so th then that that so it depends on what type of campaign if, if you play organized play or, or like back in the living greyhawk days i can totally get it why you, you you always play with a lot of other specialized characters you make up a cohesive party where you have the healer you have the the, the person that, that was the 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 the, the oh would say the, the tank and and you have the caster and and you have these kind of roles that were the foundation of fourth edition play then then i get it then then you can have problem with it but if you have a campaign that is more kind of a rounded functioning world then you get less of a problem with it because the specialized characters yeah. get hampered game -wise. i used to deal with that in-game world so in game rather than through and if campus. you're and if you're in in-game character you know if you're a bow specialist and your bow fails an item saving throw when you fall in a pit yeah you know you're out of luck mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know and and then then you have to then foes eventually get close to you so so so, yeah. so that, and it's also depending on how you are if you if you use your speciality to go around being a murder hobo then the world will deal with you because the world have dealt with other idiots who've been murder hoboing before so to speak so the powers of the world didn't exist for hundreds of years out of of of, of sure benevolence so to speak they're there because they they can actually wield power and, and the way i see it in campaign they do they have the resources and stuff so so it's a matter of making the world make sense on its own terms that that for me that's important but it depends on what type of campaign you run so what, what you put your emphasis yeah. on yeah so gary julian found something in greyhawk ruins uh a notation if you saw this in chat uh mm -hmm. that it was um zagig the black one of the veil the mage liam and melf and certain all powerful archmages and rivals of circle of eight watch the comings and goings of the power tower they call themselves the ring of five i remember that uh yeah. pretty clearly and i do not like the ring of five Okay. I feel that they were just kind of like thrown together. It was a bunch of wizard names or yeah. magic user names that just didn't weren't associated with anyone else. So it seems just like it'd be magic circles and magic groups seems to be almost inflated. They need to come up with a new everyone who kind of took the reins of, of Greyhawk development had to make a new new group name or in that same module. Yeah. 
there are a bunch of apprentices to the Ring of Five, and they're the ones that actively take in, are involved in that module. And I recall using those to great effect, but I never bought into the Ring of Five. You just thought they just a, threw all the other ones together. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. That's an interest, interesting. Uh, who broke Greyhawk Ruins? Who broke Greyhawk Ruins? Who, who Is that wrote, what you said? Who, I'm sorry. Oh. Who, who, who wrote it? <laughs> I was like Maybe Tim, that's the same Tim thing. Brown and somebody else. I okay. Think, okay. Uh, if I remember right. Um, now that it was... was supposed to have been based on, uh, you know, parts of it were based on the original cast. Yeah, and it stuff like had that, its but... moments. Yeah. I can't say I hate it because I ran the entire module twice. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay, then. Yeah, that's that impressive. was yeah. my Castle Greyhawk. Yeah, that's all I had. Right. Yeah. Because that's how many, I mean, the, the levels are crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the it's maps like, are terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 I returned that module agenda. to the bookstore I bought it from. <laughs> Uh-oh. Really? I did, yeah, I didn't like that one. and I Well, I didn't like, obviously, WG7 either as a kid. So, but, yeah. Uh-oh. I think Scott is still on. No, Scott is not on anymore. See, so yeah, right. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, um, there was a couple of uh, duds, and uh, yeah, but <laughs> you can't have you can't have uh, uh, golden apples every time, right? So, yeah. who broke harsh review? Who broke Greyhawk Room? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. So, um, I'm glad Leonard hopped on, and let's hope his, his chemo can you know he he just had another round of it. Let's hope it continues to go well. You know, let's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. let's say that. Uh, yeah. How many are besides him and Tim Cask? We're we're running out, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're, they're running uh, running low, and uh, it's a shame. But um, I'm looking forward to uh, um, you know his his release of uh, getting that, uh, Josh getting that. Yeah, he seemed really good, Josh. Really, well, yeah, yeah. He's he was very totally chipper. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And uh, I hope that uh, you know things continue in that direction. Yep. So stay, um, that, stay that way. Let me just see if we got any. No, well, you know, we're over. So Leonard left, and uh, no, no Luke yet. But we'll, uh, hey, maybe, we'll see. Maybe yeah. he forgot. But hey, you know, Carlos, uh, Carlos asked him, uh, and he said, yeah, uh, specifically said, yeah, yeah, no problem. But maybe he, maybe he found out. He snuck on already and found saw that Leonard had left. But uh, so <laughs> let's do. Uh, let's. Uh, do a, a thought uh, or something else you want to bring up, Anna, uh, about uh, Leonard or our discussion tonight? Well, one thing that we never got to, but we got close, was that we talked about the, the different uh, classes and, and the power levels and, and stuff low level. I was kind of interesting to, and I have to ask him next time, how he sees on, on the wizards, meaning wizards being so uh -huh. underpowered. At least that was my view, because they back in the day when we had players who played wizards their characters were good to use we used them to guard the horses up until like fifth level then they got fireball and they became wow. useful and i wondered was his take on what was his take on 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 wizards were they underpowered because they were kind of overpowered at high level and very underpowered at low level and we always blame that that fighter types get too much specialization and pluses but high level wizards were way more lethal and dangerous that, than than any because they can upset the whole game in in throwing one spell and they wrench the whole whole shebang once they got a certain level. If so, they know that spell. Exactly, <laughs> if they know that spell, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so that was one of the questions but that we never really got to. I was kind of interested to, to see, see his take and it was someone said that, oh, Gary didn't like wizards. I saw that comment in there and it was interesting to see what, what Leonard had, had, had said that knew him and I heard the dis were, were, the, or, were part of the discussions back then. You know, we've done things to try and enhance uh, s straight spellcasters at at first, second level. Uh, you yeah. know, giving them extra spell slot free, so that, like for example, at third level they get like two first, one second. Uh, the extra spell slot means three one. They always get the extra spell slot of their choice at one level below their highest. So yeah. if like say they're seventh level and they're four three two one in spells per level, they can now be four three three one. So they get you know, and that kind of helped a little, yeah. and some other things you know. Yeah. That, that was the only thing I really liked in fourth edition. I played it for like a year, and that was that spellcasters had 
things, fun stuff to do all the time that never ran out of even at low level. And that was, I think, one of the, the really cool things with fourth edition. They they made spellcasters cool from level one. And and that's something that I think both the uh, fifth edition and Pathfinder and other latest editions of other similar kind of forks from D D, they always they kind of rectified spellcasters and 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 reined them in a little bit at high level and beefed them up at low level and i kind of really like that yeah so uh, of course casey all the manatees now you don't especially priests don't get that casey free <laughs> garin does not need that it's straight mages <laughs> straight not even multi-classers <laughs> fight it now yes hey fairly what's funny. going on yeah, yeah. The, Fairly sorry, Leonard's already departed, and we're doing some uh, roundup here and some talk. But uh, like I said, I don't care how long we go tonight. That's cool. Uh, Mike, uh, what do you think? What do you got as far as like a synopsis of the Leonard discussion? Well, that's yeah, that's a deep one. I mean, yeah. I think he is uh, very knowledgeable. I, I don't like his uh, insights on. Uh, the game mechanics to uh, was never, I, I never realized that was something he was into. Uh, you know, since we started doing these, I heard you talk about the archer class a lot. And I never realized, because like I said, I was always focused on the mythology stuff he wrote, not game mechanics. And now it's, you know, when we talked to him several times, that he's even more into game mechanics than, than the, the, the yeah. fluff of the game, so to speak. You said he, he makes magic items a lot and yeah. created monsters. That, that wows me because I never even considered that. I mean, it seems like the day, a day doesn't go by that he's not posting a new NPC on some Greyhawk group somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He also... Um... If you go to uh, on Dragon's Foot, the the, the uh, DL, um, I'm sorry, L4 and uh, and Croton L5, there's a lot of magic items in those those references, a lot. So um, some cool stuff, uh, and I've I've incorporated some of it in. Um, so yeah, that that's a good point. Uh, just you don't realize, uh, like I said I didn't realize like, tonight that the closer Clark was Leonard's article until until Catano put together that list. So. That's pretty amazing. I thought I knew them all. So it's like, wow, that's pretty neat. Yeah, so which ones has he created now, class-wise? So he did the Archer, he did the Cloister Cleric, he did the Death Master. The Pyromancer, um, right? That one, the too. The Pyrologist, Pyrologist, yeah. Pyrologist, I'm sorry. Um, no, Cl yeah. uh, hold on one sec. Hasn't he done a few more, few others? Uh, um, a Recipe for the Alchemist. Right, oh, okay. right. Okay, um... I think that is it on classes specifically without some, okay. you know, we did an enhancement to thieves. Um, it, it's bureaucrats and politicians classes. <laughs> they were, but I think it was one of those humorous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is too. Uh, that one. And, uh, Oh, wait, no, no, no. We're missing a big one. The entertainers. Let them entertain. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Let them entertain you. The, the troubadour, the juggler, they're all, Yeah. Right, they're all classes. They're like jester-like classes, but they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is, um, that is from Dragon sixty-nine. I know my, my buddy Walt. Another great issue. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. My buddy Walt loves the love those things because you actually be multi-class entertainers. I'm like, oh my god, you guys are gonna pain me with this stuff. But we never, um, you know, the jester is enough of, of a, a painful <laughs> NPC experience. Um, so. I got to read this one. I mean, he actually wrote one in Dragon Number One, Len Lakofka. Oh, wow. Yeah, Len, Len Lakofka's fancy miniature rules. That's Dragon One, page thirteen, uh -huh. and then Dragon Three notes on women and magic. Dragon Three, page seven. So he, hmm. he yeah, uh, yeah. So he goes back that far on, on the Dragon magazines. I've, I've never, I haven't read either one of those, so I'm gonna have to take a look on those. So, uh, what do you think, Alan? Hey, Go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. No, I was just going to say, I, uh, I got into Dragon Magazine around the 80s, and then I tried to go backwards and collect over the years. Of course, I got the Dragon Magazine, you know, the CD-ROM collections. You know. Yeah. But it's I had, probably the best supplement ever published for D&D &D was that yeah. thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, yeah. That, C, that CD, that's over there somewhere that, on that wall. Yeah, absolutely. It's, plus, it's up to 250, right? Up to two fifty, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And that came out. What year did that come out? That came out 92? 90? No, it was uh, part of the silver anniversary stuff. So it was like 98, 99. Okay. I think. I th okay. Because the rules cyclopedia, that maybe that's what you're thinking of was earlier. Not not rules cyclopedia, the rules. Yeah. I don't know. The rules compendium or whatever they called it. They had an electronic version of the 2E rules that was earlier. I needed those CDs, though, because I had a really bad habit of cutting out stuff from the magazines that I wanted. Oh, you did? I'd uh -huh. I would punch holes in them and put them in the yeah. binders. Yeah. And so my magazines were just wrecked. Yeah, I pulled the modules out of them. Yeah. Yep. yeah. No, I, yeah. I kept my, but the funny thing, when I got the that uh, DVD set, there was like five or six DVDs or something with the 250 foot. They put in two of the same DVDs. I was missing them one DVD and I was like, yeah. oh, damn. So I was oh, like, no. but that, then finally, I when the internet came around, I actually, and this is kind of, I illegally downloaded the, the missing <laughs> files that, that was on the, the, so I got the, it adjusted and burned a, a DVD with the right one, so to speak. And then, then I put them all all the PDFs in my Evernote. So it was yeah. kind of funny. It took like seven or eight years or something like that from, from when I bought the DVD set until I actually got this content on one of the faulty DVDs. So that was that was kind of funny. Yeah, my, my, my brothers gave me that for Christmas one year. So. Mm -hmm. But that was fantastic when he came out. It was, yeah. it was awesome. Yeah. So Katana says, Le Le uh, Le Leonard references using ship fight rules from Dragon article in December 86. He credits the original author, one of his L4 or L5. That's great information, Katana. Thank you for that, too. That's something else I did not know. So, um, man, just uh, his hands, his works are all over the place. Article by Mar Margaret Foy. Thank you very much for that information. Um, yeah, like a bunch of the spells that are in the player's handbook, he wrote uh, a bunch that had not been in, I forget now, I'm mixing it up, there were, a he added a bunch of spells maybe to Chainmail before D&D, okay. &D, yeah. even, if I'm remembering right. Did they became versions that, that came that, into the player's that handbook? That came into the player's handbook eventually. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is article um, enhancing the, the clerics, yeah. so, right? So, so yeah. many more than the Lehman spells. So, so a lot of oh, other yeah. ones but yeah, as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to find. I didn't read this one. Dragon 36. Lehman's in a rut. Hmm. I wonder what that one's oh. about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, uh, I can't find that one. That, that, that so Leonard is really wide in his scope and what he's doing from, from number crunching and rules to, to culture and fluff and, 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 and some blogs that are kind of in-person articles and stuff too. But yeah. when, so it's, it, that kind of really spans a really wide field from, from, from one to the other. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it was a joke, Kitana. Okay. Thank you, man. Shoot, Kitana, you're on the, you're on the ball tonight, man. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So is RJK available and remotely interested in joining the stream someday? He might be, uh, but he's in Corsica, so you'd have to. Oh, that's in Corsica? Yeah, so you'd have to oh do, a, do a time zone shift uh, pretty well, significantly. We, we, we can... We can do that, or yeah, we'll see. We have, we have people from from South Korea that has stay up late. We see if someone. Can well, yeah, that was in the morning there. Was, yeah. Wow. We'll see. Yeah. Otherwise, we worst case scenario, we can see if we can do a, a interview and 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 cre create a video of it or something like that. We, yeah, that's always we, possible. Yeah, do something like that. We can record a video and, and. Yeah, he's he's working on a screenplay, so he hasn't been real active doing much else otherwise lately. Yeah. Yeah. Really. But we can always have yeah. Gary Hulian can always come on too. So. No. Ah, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> he should. As a, uh, as, a wah, wah, wah. Yep. <laughs> as a wonderful, yep. Buy you a cheesesteak, Gary. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Definitely. We oh man, have, that yep. was that was good. Hey, we yep. got some we got some cool guests coming on next week. So, yep. I want to do some. We'll do some announcements, and if Luke doesn't hop on, hey. Life goes on, man. It's been a great night for everyone. So, uh, Alan, what what's going on in your world, man? What do you got? What do you got exciting? Got a uh, new crew of players playing in Castle. My version of Castle Greyhawk. Nice. Cool. So that's fun. Ooh. Brand new second level characters starting out. <laughs> so this will be the second session on this coming 
Saturday. So that's fun. Awesome. Uh, um, I have to add, like, have... what classes do you allow? I'm just curious. Like, you have oh, Cavaliers? I've got a smart... No, <laughs> nobody's interested in playing a Cavalier. Okay. Um, I suppose if, if if somebody wanted to play a Cavalier, I'd <laughs> have to think about it, but nobody's made me think about it. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we've got a uh, Cleric, we've got a pair of Paladins, pair of Rangers, a Magic user, a Druid, uh, another Magic user. So, no Thieves. No Thieves. That's trouble. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of Scott uh, Casper kicking doors down and then setting off traps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, Crom. Uh, oh God, Crom Drod. I love Cavaliers too, because I'm I'm a glutton for punishment. So, um, but I love the Dragon Seventy Two over the Unearthed Arcana version ones. Um, just I just like the more flexibility in the weaponry, and uh, it's a good class. Um, it, it, it can get in balancing the level of missile fire is something you cannot have above two. Only the archer gets three arrows. That's just the way we do it, and that kind of helps out things. You don't have these. Uh, crazy uh, elven cavalier shooting five hours around. That's a little bit imbalancing, I'd say. But yeah. So, um, yeah, I really like the barbarian class from Dragon as opposed to how it ended up in Unearthed Arcana. What uh, about the barbarian cleric? I'd probably allow that. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Dual class it. Yeah, that's one of the ones we we never touched that article on the barbarian cleric that was like, I, I don't know, when's that Dragon? I'm going to say it's. Before 100, I believe. Um, but that was one that one of my guys always wanted to play, and I said no. But, mm. So, uh, all right, cool. So it's mostly base, base 1E classes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a 1E game, so, yeah. So. Cool. Excellent. Um, what percent of your guys, i got to ask this, uh, uh, multi-class? Uh, so far, it's just the one. Um, when, uh, when I run games for conventions and stuff, I usually have uh, the pre-gens. There's a fair number of multi-class you know, okay. options in there. Right. Um, okay. Let me think the other, the other campaign. It's... And what do you do with class level limits? I use them. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Because that is a serious, fact, that's a serious drawback to multi-class. Yeah, my uh, my character that I just retired in the game that I'm bringing the paladin in is it's a replacement character because my elf fighter magic user had already maxed out at level five, <laughs> and uh, as fighter and he's a seventh level magic user, he could go to ninth, but you know it's going to take eight hundred oh, years to get there. Oh so my like, gosh, that's brutal. He's in love. He's married. You know, let him retire, live on his riches, move away to Celine, bring in somebody else. <laughs> nice, <laughs> excellent. So, uh, Anna, what do you got going on? Uh, first, uh, the big one right now is uh, I'm nailing down the layout for the 576 Atlas, and it's starting to take shape. The, the, um, the page layout will be uh, 11 by 17. Most it will be oh, um, printed as a landscape rather than portrait, but there will be a few pages that will be kind of portrait version to that. So you kind of have to turn it around because there were a couple of pages that were really areas that were really difficult to, to get in without doing it. So probably it will be somewhere in the round of 70 something pages maybe even up to 80 nice. depending on how many overview uh, maps and stuff there will be but i realize now that i have a list of probably about 50 changes that i want to make so that will probably be i will probably spend a couple of weeks and do a revision one on the 576 map because there is a bunch of i got one good comment i haven't answered it yet a good comment on Flanny's geographical society an area that was in up in parentland that was not that was invented in in living greyhawk so that should be changed and and i have a whole bunch of other stuff that so probably about 50 or so changes that should be made so i'm going to spend like a week or 10 days or something and and kind of do all, all those changes so it will be an updated version of the map that will make it into to the atlas version and so that's the 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 big thing and then i'm also doing and making progress and you can go to my website annabemeyer.com and look at my latest blog post i show some both what the the atlas layout will be 
and also to show the the I'm doing a base elevation map for the whole of the Flannies. That will be because I want to bring in the the um, bring it into to GIS and also want to be able to have a base to build on for localized more really detailed maps. And I realized that I needed to do a base map so I can have like the base general elevation, meaning these continents, they, they have a tendency of gently sloping up from the ocean, meaning from the coastline. If you go 500 miles in, you might be 500 feet up or something in general. And these kind of really large gradients, so to speak, over large areas are really difficult to do if you do one little bit at a time. It doesn't make sense. So, so now I'm actually using uh, my old trusty world machine because that's something that world machine is actually good at. So I'm doing, it's roughly a mile per pixel. And if you go on on the same blog post you can see some of the first ones i have the the rift canyon i have white plume mountain and that area showing i have a few more areas that i worked on already that uh, the yatil mountains for instance and the high folk area and stuff and it it will yeah that's as a base i think it will be fantastic and then i can import that into better more tools and we can do exact maps of, of certain areas and stuff for and that will be something that we, we can really do and since i already have the base map for lindor isles that's one of the other things that will come that i'm going to put that into gaia and the really cutting edge tools and start doing some some work on that that will probably start in a month or so and and so so leonard can be the the judge on to see if, if it kind of fits his vision or not but that I think can look amazing. So, so that will be that's up and coming. And also, I'm working on the the continental layout is one of the things. So, I've been posting on on both on on in that same post is a little bit of it, and on the the Flanders Geographical Society. I've been harassing like once a week. I come with a slightly updated version of the continental layout of, on Earth, and so far I haven't got that many people that yelled and screamed and throw tomatoes or something at me. So, so, so it's it's kind of we'll see. Eventually, we might have something that that might work as a kind of a base map of what the planet looks like that we can kind of have as a general idea to build on that I, then i want to move in to do climate things and stuff like that for 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 other studies on on and kind of map it out so that that's an ongoing project that will probably take a couple of years to to really get something good but so i'm one thing is to make the atlas that's kind of a, a project to make a finish something that you can really use and finish the other one is building bases for future work so to speak things to so kind of base plates the, the base elevation map for the flannies is something that i need for almost everything going forward so so that and it's it was a lot more fun than i thought and and it kind of looks cool when when i put the existing flannies map on top of it it kind of looks cool already so even at that very crude scale it still looks kind of cool so yeah where do the uh, tectonics pieces fit in there, Anna? Is that's that stuff the, you're doing as part thing. of the base elevation or the continental uh, no, not layout? Not really. Both, I, I'm, I'm doing the base elevation, and then we have to go in and and look at the the um, the idea. And I have to have Maldin's kind of uh, he he will shred a lot of that to pieces, and and then we have to go in and, and do the because this is the first first step, so to speak. So both the continental layout and the base elevation maps need to, I need to get his scrutiny on it and he needs to tell me what, uh, I need to change things that are kind of screwed up and, and this will not work. But on the other hand, a lot of it is based on the existing maps. So, so we can't go too overboard because we already have what it's supposed to look like, so to speak. So it's kind of a um, two-pronged approach. We need to uh, adapt the geology and the elevation to the stories and the text, and then we have to kind of come up with the geology and, and the, 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 the what the elevation and stuff is so that it actually matches the stories. That's the that's the key part, so to speak. So so we have to retrofit both geology and, and geography and stuff to to match the stories. That's the that's the interesting bit. So it's like a reverse engineering a planet. When you know the who lives there, then you have to kind of reverse engineer. So when I've talked to others about making fantasy mapping, it's normally when you make real world maps, then you go out and survey the use aerial photo, you use uh, 
you go out and, and with a geodolite and, and one of these things and you measure the, the angle between mountaintops and, and, and so on, and then you can get precise measurements. So you use satellite photos and stuff. But here's the other way around. You have to read the text and then you have to kind of envision what could be what could be the terrain that makes the story happen. So stories happen. So it's, it's kind of a reverse surveying technique in a way. Cool. Bishop yeah. ADD one e asks you, uh, do you use Campaign Cartographer three, and what do you think? No, of I have a license for it. I was actually one of the first one that that bought the license. I I was actually I think I bought a beta license back in the nineties or something like that when the first version of it came out, and and I actually translated part of the manual to Swedish back in a long long time ago, and and then. Then I kind of abandon it because I'm not that much of a CAD person, so so I kind of abandon the the. But it's a really cool tool, and if you if you're used to working with CAD stuff, it, it's you can do amazing stuff with Fantasy Cartographer, it, for definitely. So it's more like if you if you are the painterly type, then you might not like it. But if you if you like to to to, to do technical drawings and then make them look good, then then it's it's fantastic. So it has a lot of of things going for it. It's more like if you like that type of software so so i should like it because 3d programming is even more technical but but i guess i want one or the other so, so it, it is a tool i just hope that they update it because it's starting to be show its age a bit they haven't done any major updates in the, almost 10 years now so they need to mm. they need to boost it a bit the fourth version of it and i think it will be really cool now there are actually better tools coming out and better tools out that can do like incarnate and stuff that are much easier to use but it's it's fairly versatile so so i can i can recommend it yeah if you if you like that type of, of, of tool that is a bit cad like so to speak so you have to know a little bit of commands and press a certain mouse button and you have to read down what what it expects the next time and stuff if you can get over that hurdle so to speak you can do some really cool stuff with it i got a i got a a question um it's out of the blue mm -hmm. but anna um because uh, uh, maps uh alan mike brainstorm this where would you place g3 if not the hell furnaces mm, that's interesting mm -hmm. yeah. that's a tough one isn't it you can't put it at you can't put it in uh um uh, the shield lands uh, because you already got Corruptus there, right? You know, on, on the. Uh, but you need volcanoes. You need, you need volcanoes. Yeah. yeah. And you need not only a single mountain because otherwise you could have white blue mountain. You need like a range of mountains. Yeah. The, the giants and stuff needs to. to is, there any volcanic, is there any volcanic activity up in the Yattles? And not so much in the Yattles that is recorded, but they're definitely up all the way up in the crystal mist. There are there are volcanoes here and there, at least up as far up as the Jotuns, if I remember. Gary there says the burning cliffs, but that's awfully far north, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. And the burning cliffs are interesting. That they they are, and and that's one of the the things that are I think very appropriately placed. Because it, yeah. that coastline needs to be very high because the, otherwise the, the cold marshes would drain north, not south. So it makes perfect sense. So that's one of the, the I think, brilliantly yeah. placed stuff. So I think there's some uh, supposed to be some volcanism in the land of black ice area too, right? So you mm -hmm. could like tip, move it and insert it into some area there kind yeah. of. And there is a, another a volcanic area that is kind of overlooked, and that's actually the Flinty Hills and, and Southern Rakers, because if you read the Gourd books, in the spa is actually full of, right. of it's like Yellowstone. It, it has these yeah. hot pools and, and stuff like that. And and so so I need to to boost up that area because that looks too mundane on my map. So I need to kind of introduce that because I I got the sense when I read the Gord books that Inspa is is full of steaming pools and, and stuff like that. It's it like like Yellowstone. So it's not the volcano that sticks up and and spew out like like White Plume Mountain that is like Vesuvius or. or or, or Etna or, or Fuji, but more like the, the Yellowstone volcano that is like a 
the large area that it has a magma pool down and it's kind of pushing the whole area up. It's not a mountain sticking up. So it's not as sexy. So exactly. It's yeah. a, a, not the type of volcano. So, so don't the slave lords have... live on a volcano? Uh, yeah. Keller yeah, Lakos. Yeah. yeah, yeah Pomarsh is, is, a, yeah, it's, Pomarsh it's is a, dead. A vol yeah. It's a volcanic uh, peninsula. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there. Yep. Yeah. So, um, and then the Isle of Dread too, if you, you know, yeah. insert that. Yes. Yep. Or is, Carlos is Fireland. I assume that's Iceland. Oh, right? fire, so. yeah, Fireland is is supposed to be full mm -hmm. of volcanoes and stuff. So, yep. Mm -hmm. The question is in relation to, and and I'm not, this is not a bash on anyone. Please, guys, on someone recommending you run this, you run Temple, then you run the G series, and you run the, you know. Uh, so, um, my my response to the to the 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 whisper is, uh, this um, um, person says, well. Um, Valoon and Friandi have sent them to do T T one to four in that area. I say make it a Knights of the Heart thing, and then you can say the Knights of the Heart have want to help Sterich, and that's how you start the G series out, and that's the tie in, right? And that's how you do it, and that way you don't have to move it and relocate it. I think that would be a better solution for yeah. for the question. Would be uh, you know uh, that would be what I would do. I, I tie it into an organization which tends to like my order of Yulik puts its tentacles all over the place. The Knights of the Heart maybe you know are similar, um, so that's what I would do. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, no problem, man. Uh, I appreciate the, really appreciate the questions. Yeah, like I said we'll try and answer right. anything. Yep. And, and Bishop, your cheer. I'm going to save that for Ooh. annoying Tim. On Saturday night, those th th those th they got enough hero points for. I'm going to give those two special hero points to uh, to us for Tim's Saturday night special. So there you go. Um, yeah, and and that's the way you work it. That's how you work it. You just come up with a reason behind something that makes yep. sense, and then you travel. And we're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about that on Sunday as well, uh, uh, which we go over what we're doing on Sunday. So Mike, what about you on shout outs there? Well, um, if you've been following Grey Hawkery, I've been digging up a lot of my old second edition stuff and yes. writing about wars that I did. Yeah. Look at the, look at this file. Yes. Oh, wow. I love it. Yeah. That's ten more blog posts than that one. Oh yeah, it's it's really spinning out of control because I'm like finding old notes and stuff, and it's like I'm reliving it all over again. Uh, I didn't realize I had waged so many wars across the planet. <laughs> <It's>, Everyone <laughs> destroys it once oh in their life. God. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, yeah. Uh, I, I might have overdone it. Nah. But, uh, oh, you had fun you just with need it. to build it back up again and that's equal fun. So yeah. So yeah, there'll be a lot of articles on that, but I don't want to like end up being a one trick pony. I'm gonna have to like intersperse other things in between there. But I still want the grand. I want the rec, the lifetime records of all the Blood Bowl teams out of Greyhawk. I really want that. Yeah, yeah. I really want that, man. That's just like that's cool. See which one was the greatest of all of them. So yeah, I got uh, all the stuff I was sitting on all this time. It's good material to adapt. As you're going back and kind of digging into your old stuff, do you uh, do you find yourself wanting to? Uh, change it or update it or kind of tweak it or are you kind of trying to preserve that original vibe as you're I'm, doing it i'm really just trying to preserve right i'm finding that trying to translate it from my handwritten notebook paper to text on a computer screen is a task because not only was my handwriting not so great the it's also fading mm -hmm. on the paper you know yellowing and all this stuff so i'm like Really, my I got I had eye strain one night from just reading over my notes, and I'm thinking, you know, what started out as a, a three part article now is like this going to be this huge epic thing that I'm obsessed with now. You like David Leonard? You started yeah. a, a multi yeah, thing and kept all this going. stuff all this stuff was interspersed through a dozen different folders. So I'm also wow. having to too. like piece this together. It was not in any kind of order i'm having to recreate the history of my campaign and it's yeah that's great that's why you need diligent note taking early on yeah that's the master <laughs> of, did, of record I, keeping here i did keep good records it's just all out of you know the the pages are scattered everywhere like, I, 
you yeah. gotta have that stuff. Like I've said on multiple shows, I have not thrown out a single, unless it was scratch, right? So you, I haven't thrown anything out since 1980. Mm-hmm. Not one piece of paper with with a character on it or a monster or an adventure. Yeah. Not one. So, yeah. It's uh, it's cool. You got to have it. You got to have it. And then it's just – now you can look back, man, and reminisce yep. on stuff. And I don't make some know great... why I was keeping such meticulous timelines and stuff back then, though, except to yeah. myself. Because mm-hmm. I it couldn't have known I was going to share this in the future. Well, you wanted to be a game designer. Admit it. We all want it when we, we start playing. We always want to, to do this. Yeah, that's weird. When I was young, I was I was always trying to design um, role playing games for yeah. stuff that we didn't have role playing games for, like Star Wars. Ah, oh, okay. Gosh, yeah. I had the D covered. But... Star Wars is huge now. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Well, that is cool, and um, still, the, yeah. If you win the lottery, if you win the lottery, you're not buying it from Hasbro. Sorry, Casey, it doesn't matter. I don't <laughs> think they're selling it. Um, so I'm throwing around something. I want people, um, before I do my announcements, I want you guys to ponder this because I'll probably get in trouble the more I'm thinking about this, but I don't care. So Anna and I, I can't do this. Uh, I've talked to someone who can help me on this. We are seriously going to try to do Greyhawk Con VTT at some point. I mean, not VTT, but, you know, virtual Greyhawk Con. Uh, at some point, I have some people who are interested in doing, yeah, but I don't know if I can call it Greyhawk Con. <laughs> I can call it Flan, the Flanice mm. Con, right? I, calling it Greyhawk Con may get me in a lot of trouble, correct? Yeah, might be. Yeah. Yeah. Alan is making like, money ah. on it. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> if you're not making money yeah, on it. Yeah, it's not about making money on it. So, because um, I'm a con, uh, I would prefer it to be Greyhawk Con. So, uh, yeah, um, Sewell Con, Earth Con. There's a lot of different things that we can. Yeah. Uh, probably not Greyhawk Con, but the five of you guys call things Greyhawk Reborn. And Anne is in the house. Oh, yeah. Hi, Anne. I'm, I'm yep. sorry, who's in the house? Oh, and Frank, Nightheart Gaming. Oh, hey, Ann. I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't see you. Hey. Yeah. I think Frank's been lurking all night, too. So, oh, which is okay. cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hey. A lot of, um, so, uh, yeah, Leonard is going here. And uh, so I got some people who are interested in assisting. Um, but, uh, um, well, there's little old uh, classes from old Yeah, you gotta, you gotta do it. I, I love the variety and the capability of all the different things you can do, uh, with especially with a lot of well-written material. I know I'm probably the only person in the entire world that uses the Duelist as a as a playable as a PC class, but with balance, oh. uh, I, you use the oh. Duelist too. Yeah, my I, brother had a Duelist. Oh, uh, played him up to ninth or tenth level. I love. I love that class. Love the pluses with the same weapons, the parry, the death blow. We had a we, so this is a couple weeks ago, Alan. We had Tom has a duelist like fifth level, and he went all against a, a dark a baddie, dark dark elf of magic resistance from the underworld or whatever. I called her a blade master. That's basically another duelist, and they're fighting each other. And so they both got to the point where within one round of each other, they both had to parry the death blow. He made, uh, Tom's character made a save and the Dark Elf failed. So it was pretty funny. Nice. Yeah, it was, it was neat. The fight went on forever. While they, everyone else is fighting, they kind of You did, did not it. know I was left-handed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Uh, it, it was cool. So that's good to yeah, see. So we, we, used, uh, we used a bunch of all those other classes. We, we had a, he ran a Time Lord who was the main, oh. uh, main leader of our party. Um, and I wrote up a whole bunch of additional powers and planar stuff for that character. Excellent. I- I'm glad to see that someone else uses some of the other stuff because I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, Thunder said he likes to see those classes being actually played. And I appreciate that. But, you know, us old, gr- uh, we're not Gronyards. Gronyards are, I'm not a Gronyard. I, I, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. I'm a, I'm a 1E, 2E DM. That's what I am, uh, you know, which is cool. So. And Alan sounds like you're a one EDM. Carlos is a one EDM. Tim's a one EDM, which you'll see Saturday night, you know. And it's good to see that there's a lot of us around. So um, let's do some quickie announcements here. So, all right, Greyhawk, Greyhawk Con. You guys are in on that? You got, we need a lot of participation if we do it. 
and we need to uh, plan it out well, and we need to set a date that it doesn't conflict with others, other um, conventions, because Cobalt Con's coming right up, and Champion Con's right after that, and uh, I, I asked around. They said, "Yeah, it would be bad. It would be bad to place it in sometime in May." And 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 because Champion Con, it's life or death for tabletop events. If they Origins don't. window might be available now that they moved to, August, to October. So that's something to. Think oh, they about. did. Yeah. So my big one is Reaper Con. I'm trying to find out if Reaper Con's going to go. That's Labor Day weekend. Because if Reaper Con doesn't go, then that, then that window is wide open for me. Because if Reaper Con's on, I have to go. Because you know with Reaper being a sponsor, so but uh, I you know I prefer to call it Greyhawk Con. I don't want to have my name associated in there anywhere, guys. Thank you, I appreciate that. But all right, let's get to some announcements tomorrow night, right? Now that I got all these nice things Anna taught me how to make. I have to use them. <laughs> now you're dangerous. I am dangerous now. Tomorrow night, the finale of the Fallen Abbey. Okay. Uh, the Night Stalkers are in the county of Yulik at Thornwar Thornwall Abbey seeking St. Jillian's Hammer, which is a demon slaying weapon. Uh, it's a warhammer, and there are demons of Orcus there who won it as well, and you get the idea of what's going on. We, that started last week. It's by Expeditions Retreat Press. Uh, it's highly modified, but I love his stuff. Uh, it's on Drive Through RPG, and all his stuff's a dollar fifty. So whenever I, my brain is dead, and I just want to modify something. He's got a lot of stuff to pull down. So uh, very nice. That's tomorrow night. We finished that stratagem giveaway tomorrow night, guys. So Casey, you can start doing the drawing thing now if you want, even though it won't count or work. So yeah, tomorrow night is a stratagem giveaway. I'm giving away two more of the Titan dice sets. All right, I'm, I'm giving you, <laughs> I'm giving away a pink one and I'm giving away a black one, and that'll be tomorrow night. One for subs, one for signups. All right, beautiful. Let's go to Saturday night. Us, we have a Saturday night special this week. Tim's dun dun dun. dun, dun, dun. Tim's city state of the Invincible Overlord is back. With the ever mysterious Tim DMing, I get to play, which is wonderful. Yeah, the drawing thing's not on, guys. It's a joke. Uh, it'll be on tomorrow night, though. All you guys can hit that all the day, uh, all day long. This will be remotely done too, so it'll be the first time we've played this remote. So we'll see how that goes. And uh, this should be the first time in thirty years of the campaign that uh, my characters actually, any of our characters, ever met the Overlord. We've seen him once, and this may be the first time we meet him. So. That'll be Saturday night. And those hero points are going to uh, uh, City State. City State Invincible Overlord, Saturday. When do you play? Tim is DMing. Oh, I'm playing Dervilia. She's a human female cavalier. She was a paladin and couldn't handle it. She's lawful neutral. She, uh, she just, uh, lawful good was not for her. And so I have a, I have her and a fighter clerk mage, a poor man's gazumba. His name's Kixano with a Q. Uh, he's kind of like the do-gooder in the party. He's neutral good, but he's, yeah. So there are the two characters I have and that. Thank you for that question, Thunder. All right, Sunday night. This is going to be a great show, and uh, I haven't lined up any uh, guests to assist me on this, but I imagine some people may want to. And you're um, beginning a Greyhawk campaign. This was an idea from a couple of people from Posts. So, um, what we're going to discuss, and I got a whole bunch of them here already, and Luck Leonard's is on there, is what adventure series or adventure do you start your characters off with and where, and just throwing out some ideas. So, I got all these low-level adventures here. I'm, I'm finding more. I'm getting as many as I can together, and we're just going to gonna brainstorm and help people out, and some people may have different ones they wanted to start off with. Whether it's homebrew or or yeah, <laughs> S one really, oh yeah. So um, that's what we're gonna do. We're just gonna have a little fun with that, and then uh, uh, there's not a single thing of Forgotten Realms in there, Gary. So that's 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 wrong, man. This is a UK five by Graham. There, that's a level. That's a first level adventure. Eye of the Serpent. Anyone ever play it? No, but I have it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There's not a single, single Forgotten Realms one in there, man. So I hate Forgotten Realms. I mean, you know, I'm sorry. A Drizzt, uh, you know. Forgotten Realms makes modules? Yeah. <laughs> Think about this. 
No, they make railroads, right? Oh, man. <laughs> it, okay. It's a good one, uh, uh, Josh. Yeah. So think about this. Dark Elves, D3. They were awesome, right? They fought with bucklers. They had death lances. But they weren't like crazy, right? They weren't dual wielding, longsword in each hand, crazy abominations until Forgotten Realms and the Renzo Barons and box set showed up, right? And then they're all dual wielding, no penalties, just insanity, right? So you just got to balance it, man. You just got to go back to what works. As, and that is... I not prefer fun. my uh, Dark Elves with uh, hand crossbows tipped in poison. They should be. They should be to to incapacitate. Yeah, absolutely. And the wand of viscid blobs. Oh one yes, of my favorite magic item. It's, it is because uh, alcohol will dissolve it, and you could rip yourself apart trying to get out of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's an it, it's. Uh, there's all those great items. And remember, uh, subterranean lizards as their riding mounts and all. You know. So I'm sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but <laughs> um, it's just driving me driving me crazy. Um, and then uh, next week, what's going on the next Wednesday? We go back to Living Greyhawk. All right. We have the Sultanate of Zyph uh, triads coming. And I, uh, my notes are smashed somewhere in all those other ones. So, yes. Oh, I, I dangerously feel like I'm going to be a troll on that episode. <laughs> Why is that? Because <laughs> I got a lot of old uh, bias. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I think they were all. It was Zyph was in Canada for the most part, so um, yeah. that'll be an interesting one, though, uh, for for to just to see where that goes. Yeah. Uh, excited. Yeah, definitely another uh, another good one. And then, um, and we got. I just got to broadcast this because I want everyone to know. I put every, the three of you through the ringer in an adventure, and I get to do that with. Um, the Living Greyhawk All Stars on Saturday, May 9th will be the next one. Nice. Okay. So, I uh, and there right now there's four confirmed. There's Joe Selby. There's Casey Brown. There's Vernon Vincent and Ron Lindeed. And uh, I don't know Susan's last name will be the fifth. And um, we want to talk about negotiating. Are you ready, Alan? Uh, please say no. They want they want me to allow. Are you ready? A multi class halfling. Magic user thief. No. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Ah, uh, there you go. Alan, uh, the grow dog has spoken there, Casey. So, um, yes, no, just that's not happening. So, and the adventure, I'm going to really torture them with the mongrels of the putrid tongue. So, uh, a, a, a contraption that was made by, by Tim all those years ago, but brought to its fine you know, vileness by me a little bit more. So that's Saturday, May 9th. And that's why, one of the reasons why I'm not doing CoboCon, because uh, CoboCon's in between this Saturday and then two Saturdays, and that's just, I can't, it's, it's too much. So um, we'll see everyone tomorrow night. Guys, hopefully it was, you guys had a fun time. Thank you, Alan, for coming on. Thank oh, you so sure. very much. And Mike and Anna, thanks as always, having... thanks. It was a, it was a blast. Oh, Sorry, thank I, you, I, Jay, for organizing all this and keeping no, yeah. no problem. Time. I'm yeah. just I'm a little disappointed that uh, Luke didn't even message me, um, but maybe he had something going on with military or something that came on. So let's yeah. give him the benefit of the doubt. On that not a big deal. We had a great show. Thanks, Phantom. Thank you. We'll see you all tomorrow. Oh, there's Tim. So uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, tongue tools coming with me. Somehow you got to get that tongue tool to my house for when they're here. So, or you can hop on the show and utilize it somehow. So, all right. Thank you all. We'll see you. Uh, yes. We'll see you. We'll see, see you guys later. Night. See you tomorrow yeah. night. Thank you. <laughs> stay safe. Yes. <laughs> Try to stay safe. Stay safe in your D&D campaign. Ah, uh, that was cool. Good deal. Yeah, it was fun. Thanks for inviting me on. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate Let, it. You never met uh, Leonard person to person. That's great to see. Nope. That, yeah. No, that was no. that was fun. Probably That's... written back and forth with him over I don't know twenty years or more now. But, um, yeah, yeah. He's um, he's an interesting character. He really is. Oh yeah. Uh, hey, he gave away something that I I didn't expect that to uh, happen at all. I mean, he's like, hey, let's give away something. 
who won the pouch? Bloodwild underscore uh, WD won the pouch for his question on how Leonard got into role playing initially. That was the one that was a consensus. Um, so, Corey, thanks for coming back on this. When is Ravager the Mind being released? That is up to Josh, who's um, Zarathon and, uh, and Leonard. Um, the Lake Hill map is not in. So, um, uh, it's up to uh, it's up to them when it gets released. But oh yeah, that's okay. all right. We, we always uh, no. This is our shtick. We talk over the we talk over the ads. That's our shtick. Yeah, we do this every every week. Yeah, it's cool because you know they're just ads. <laughs> I made the ad up though. Uh, most well, not the Harbor Town one, but the next one for Miniature Building Authority. I mean, you know, it's it's all cool. So. Yeah, it's like the we're a little uh, MST3K here, right? So when you say you're giving away those pink dice, are you like trying to get rid of them because you don't like them? No, no, uh, these are two sets that are unopened. Oh. No, I have two more sets. They gave me uh, um, so. Um, no, I meant because you're not have much luck. With no, I, I'm keeping mine until they start rolling. Well, I'm going to keep on using them. I'm going to force myself to to love them. <laughs> But um, so last. No, after that last game. <laughs> oh my god, that was brutal. That was brutal. Um, Stratagem gave me two months of giveaways in one month. Um, so uh, that you know, just because of what's going on with COVID and stuff, so they gave me a whole bunch of sets. So I knew I had some from last month to give away and this month. So yeah, I usually do one Stratagem, one Stratagem giveaway per month, and uh, on a Thursday night. And so yeah, we're giving them away again. So. Well, this one I made up completely. Kirk's got some new stuff coming, so. Yeah. Looks like some good uh, some good fodder for uh, Renee Shantytown, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a little modern looking, but I think I you can make it look rustic. I was going to say corrugated, uh, yeah. Yeah. like steel yeah. sheets. This doesn't seem to, to be that fantasy-esque kind of, but it's... We have a new video that's on Fans of Miniature Building Authority's website that Kirk's supposed to upload to me on uh, Dropbox. <laughs> I'm going to make a new ad out of it, and it mixes Shantytown and Harbor Town and all his European buildings all together. It's really great looking, and uh, yeah. That water, I believe, is a uh, new mat. Uh, it's, um, oh gosh. It's deliciously polluted looking. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, it C reminds me of... Um... Cigar Box Mats, I think is the name of the company, and they make uh, fleece cloth mats that you can overlay on terrain. It's not PVC. It's not um, It's not uh, neoprene, which I love the neoprene. So, um, he, yeah, it's called Cigar Box Mats. I believe that's from. Hmm. So, yeah pretty cool <laughs> yeah 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 it's, it's neat so I get yeah you get cholera just looking at it I mean it's it's like it reminds me of like uh, what I, I, yeah, that's Josh now. Said. it reminds <laughs> me of uh, of, of uh, Thailand uh, the pictures I see in Thailand yeah, it's, yeah, it's of the like water a, yeah. oh just put some lollipops out there. It could be uh, Willy Wonka chocolate factory. There you go. <laughs> I've got a Willy Wonka level in Castle Greyhawk. <laughs> Never thought of it. Oh, man. Well, one last check. Nope. Just want to check one last time. See if we got a Facebook message. So it didn't. So, so everyone, I'll see you tomorrow night. We'll all see you. And uh, everyone, stay safe, please. And. Uh, it'll be a remote play again tomorrow night. The terrain's all set up and changed. They're gonna, the adventuring party needs to try and find their way into the maze to get St. Jillian's hammer. And now they have the maze key. Um, so it may be easier. Maybe we'll, we'll find out like, tomorrow night. So, all right, I'm gonna call it an Very evening. Cool. Is anyone on the raid? Well, we're moving a short amount of, uh, um... Night, y'all. Good night. All right, we're gonna. I'm gonna jump into Praetor's Rejects, Sarah, and we'll just raid into them, and then we'll call it an evening. 
we'll probably get about 25 people left to uh, the raid here. Let me pop over to that. We'll raid All right. Day. See you guys yeah, later. Yeah, Alan, thanks, time. man. Hopefully, yeah, uh, thanks. We'll see you all soon. Everyone have a great night. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, we're getting almost 30. 30. 31. That's good. Wow, that's a nice nice size. Nice size, right? Oh, Anna, I got uh, the...